Okay, the sound should be working now. Testing, testing. Yeah. Are, are you picking up sound? Oh, uh, they just... should, yeah, they should be picking up sound right now. Okay. We're ready to start at around three o'clock, so five more minutes. There's Bill. Bill, you you all set? Yes. Good deal. Well, thank you, man. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me uh, on this Zoom presentation. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it should be um, a fascinating lecture. Yeah, so the only part, let me see, share screen. Oops, no, I don't want to share my screen. There's Mark McCandlish. Advanced sharing options. Who can share all? all okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, I've got that all set. Screen sharing is set up. For some reason, that defaults to a weird thing. Okay. Okay, and then I'm then I'm gonna have a demo about half. Okay. You guys all set? Yeah, we're good. Thanks. Thanks for your time. Yeah, around the backyard and stuff. Yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. Okay, have a good one, guys. Party time. As Aurora said, it's party time right now. Sorry. Get all your drinks ready. Get your quarantine. Yeah. <laughs> a quarantine. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, Bill, let, let's not do that. I, no, I, I don't want to hold hold on. Uh, can you stop sharing? Yeah, I'm gonna stop you sharing just for a moment, okay? Okay. And that that's not your fault. I'm gonna do a brief intro and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Then we will then we will go through our screen sharing thing yet again. And Mark, I'm going to mute you out now. Oh, no problem. Okay. And? Sound effects? Yeah, sound effects. Okay, we have one minute left here, and I will do my intro and then hand it over to you, Bill. Great. So I'll spotlight myself here. <sighs> Let me see if I'm doing this right. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Again, as I was saying to Mark earlier, I was feeling nervous. I started this 1130 and nobody showed, nobody showed, nobody showed. I thought, uh oh, that could be a problem. But looks like we got the whole crew. Hello, everybody. Sorry for. My, my microphone was on mute. 
Oh yeah, no worries. Uh, Jean-Francois, let me, let me meet you back out. So we're gonna go to Bill here in just a sec. Mm -hmm. Greetings from Canada. Thanks, and Ziggy, let me mute you out as well. I'm, I'm trying to mute everybody out and I'm gonna do the intro here in just a sec. Okay, sorry about that. We have folks, I, I don't know if you guys can see, but we have folks pouring into the... Okay, and there is, there's my chat window. Okay. Okay, well, why don't I begin? So I am gonna start now. Okay, three, two, one. Welcome to APEC. It's January 30th, and I'm your moderator, Tim Ventura. First, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today on this call, and let's do a big shout out to everyone watching us on the YouTube live stream. I'd also like to thank Mark Sokol and the Falcon Space team, and give a giant thank you to today's scheduled presenters, Bill Alec and David Chester. Bill will be presenting on his research into ZPE and anti-gravity, and David will be discussing engineering approaches and applications to quantum gravity. After that, Mark will be showcasing progress on his latest projects. And if we have time, we may do a request for ad hoc presentations as well. So I have a couple of quick announcements. Our new website is almost ready. You can check that out at www.altpropulsion.com. Again, that's www.altpropulsion.com. We're continuing to post conference events on the American Anti-Gravity and Alien Scientist channels and websites. And just Google those, you can find them easily. You can view our full conference events at either one of those. Please save your questions during the conference for the Q&A session after each presentation. You can raise your hand or ask a question in chat We'll go through them after each presenter finishes. And uh, that was just about it. So thank you again for joining us. And let's welcome Bill Alec as our first presenter. And I'm going to spotlight Bill right now. There we go. Okay, I think we're on. <clears throat> okay, Tim, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to this conference here. And we're gonna get into a lot of detail uh, concerning free energy and how I'm connecting it with anti-gravity as well. So this is going to be an in-depth presentation, a um, lot of detail. Um, so let's get started here. So let's share the screen. Okay. Uh, can you all see the screen? Yeah, it looks great. Oh, okay, very good. Okay, um, connecting free energy and anti-gravity. Um, let's go to the next slide here. Oops. Okay. Um, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, Mark, you know, you had Mark as the guest here um, at Candlish, and uh, he gave some details on the ARV, and I thought I'd um, give you my view uh, on this technology, the Alien Replica Vehicle, ARV Flux Miner. <clears throat> now, when I first looked at this uh, several years ago, um, when I'm looking at, you know, what I'm looking at here, I didn't really see anything that caught my eye. You know, what's the anti-gravitational component here? And so Mark did all these illustrations uh, for, uh, for an aerospace company. Um, and I believe it was back in the mid 1980s. And I noticed that, um, you know, looking at these illustrations here, uh, you see these tanks, uh, the center column, of course, has your, uh, your, your Tesla coil. Um, uh, when I saw this aluminum flywheel, you know, at the base of, of this 
of, of this unit here, I immediately thought of, well, it gives it stabilization, okay, in flight. That you're gonna have propulsion here, but there's no way to keep the, uh, the craft stable in flight unless you have some, something rotating in here. And that, of course, is this flywheel device. So my interpretation of this is that it's, it's basically a gyroscope to keep the craft stable. And then of course it's powered um, uh, with a hydrogen and oxygen fuel cell arrangement. So, so the, before a flight, they would fuel this craft up um, with most likely uh, hydrogen and oxygen and run it, uh, run this craft using uh, fuel cell technology, which was quite common in the, uh, uh, the space industry here. So let's go to the next slide. And here's Mark, contracted by Lockheed. Okay, um, and then Mark presented this illustration here showing three versions of the craft. And uh, of course, uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on this smaller version here. Um, but the three versions, uh, three various sizes of the craft were built. And I assume this was built, uh, these craft were built back in the 70s, maybe late 60s, early 70s. Now, uh, in this illustration, uh, something very interesting was added in. And of course, the center column here used a Tesla coil. And then at the base, we show a capacitor arrangement. So we're going to be using very high voltage uh, to generate very high voltage using the Tesla coil. And it's going to produce an, uh, an electromagnetic flux on the outside of this craft. And it, it loops, the flux is gonna come out the top, which is gonna be what I generally read as uh, the other, the electrode of the uh, capacitor, okay? Which is, uh, you have these capacitor plates at the base of the craft, and that's one electrode. And then the other electrodes are going to be at the top or near the top of this uh, flux liner. And so the flux is electromagnetic flux is going to come out and then wrap around uh, the outside of this craft. Now I noticed some illustrations done many years ago in relating to the, um, uh, the German Hanabu craft. And they always refer to this to this flux as a Geist field, okay? And of course, Geist tra translates uh, in German, t in, in English, to uh, like a ghost or spirit field. And that, that, of course, was on the outside of this craft. So what you're looking at here is a very high frequency oscillator, electromagnetic oscillator that is somehow interacting with gravity. And then with this illustration here, Mark mentioned that this coil arrangement um, above the base of the craft here, that they use mercury, okay, or a mercury vapor um, and coils of it here, where one side is connected to uh, one electrode at the base of this craft, and then the other one is connected would be connected to the Tesla coil um, at the base of the Tesla coil. And then um, <coughs> this mercury is the whole key uh, to the operation of this device. Okay, this is what gives you the anti-gravitational component. Okay, so the next slide right here. So why mercury? Well, it turns out that this experiment was done uh, and posted at Stefan Hartman's overunity.com website. And I just happened to catch it one day and downloaded the image. And this experimenter was using a fluorescent tube. 
And the way that it's wired in this configuration here is that the transformer uh, was operating in, in a flyback mode, uh, low frequency operation, and would energize this tube. Now, of course, inside fluorescent tubes is, a, is of course, a mercury or a mercury vapor, okay? So immediately I thought that, okay, well, we're connecting an experiment here in free energy, utilizing mercury, um, and, and how this correlates to the mercury being used in the ARV. So what's going on here with mercury? Well, we get this, if, if you look this up in Wikipedia with mercury, you get something that they call an avalanche effect. And this avalanche effect is, is essentially what we would call, you know, in quantum mechanics here, negative resistance. And so with this avalanche effect occurring here, you would get excess energy, okay, from this technology. But it's not just ordinary energy. This is negative energy is what we're working with here. That's the whole key to this, to get uh, negative energy to couple in producing this anti-gravitational effect. So what you're seeing here is basically a, a system for harnessing free energy using this uh, negative resistance effect that's found in mercury vapor. And I think this directly correlates to the technology used in the ARV. Okay, so the next slide. Okay, so what is this avalanche effect? Well, I'm calling it, it's, it's a quantum tunneling effect or creates a quantum tunneling effect. And what's actually going on with the electrons is that there's a mass <coughs> reduction effect, okay, to create this negative energy. And the field that this negative energy produces is what the Germans with the Hanover craft called their Geist field, okay? And that's what the flux around the craft would form is this Geist field effect. Okay, so what is this quantum tunneling effect? Well, we see here in this illustration, uh, in classical physics, you know, we're pulling, let's say, an electron up the hill, that's your electric force. But then with quantum tunneling is that there's an extra force applied to this electron <laughs> to get it to what we call quantum tunneling. And that quantum tunneling is, a, is the mass reduction effect or reducing the mass of these electrons by twisting them or applying a torsion field effect to that electron and getting it to quantum tunnel. Okay, so what we're doing is applying another force to this electron to get it to curl into the direct sea of negative energy. And this is done by changing the phase angle of the electron. And this is what I'm calling the quantum tunneling effect. And so what, what is this negative energy and how do we store it? in coils, for example. Well, when we look at equation one, that's your typical equation for calculating the energy in that B field, okay, the magnetic field around a coil or passing through a coil. Equation two is a complex version of that, of that B field. And that's what we do when we apply our torsion field effect. We cause that electron to rotate essentially into another space. And that space is what we call the complex field, okay? Now, when you square the complex magnetic field is where you get negative energy. That's your negative energy solution. So the, the square of the complex field is negative energy is the square of a uh, the square of a squ uh, the square root of a negative one is negative one that's your negative energy 
And so uh, a number of years ago, I used this formula here that's, that's called Euler's formula. And that's really is dictating the, the rotation of this spin axis of these electrons to get this torsion field effect. And that's what covers, that's what allows the electron to rotate from our positive energy universe into this negative energy universe to 180 degrees out of phase with our universe. So this negative energy universe, which is really from the future, we're, we're looking at that as future energy, is accessible using Euler's formula applied to the B field and causing that B field to rotate um, into this complex field. Now the complex field, which is really the Geist field, okay? And that's what these, uh, these craft are using um, to create this negative energy effect is that the complex field is at 90 degrees out of phase with our universe. And the negative energy that's being utilized here is 180 degrees, which is the square of the complex field. Okay, to give you the negative energy, which is 180 degrees <coughs> out of phase, giving you the negative energy component here. Okay, so that, that's the negative energy that would be stored in a coil just by changing the phase of the electron. Okay, so what we end up with um, is with torsion, and we can apply this to mass. And this is what gives you the, the effect of, of a reduced mass because that electron is rotating, okay? It's rotating from our space into another space. So when you hook up instrumentation and try to measure what this electron's doing, what you're gonna see is a mass reduction. And that's because the mass is now beginning to manifest out of our universe into this negative energy universe. Okay, that's 180 degrees out of phase. And so just by applying or Euler's formula to the mass of the electron, Okay, times gamma is what gives you the energy of that electron. And that electron energy can be either positive or negative, depending upon what the phase of that, of that electron is at. So this, this shows how it manifests between dimensions of our real 3D space, and that, it, and that at 90 degrees from our universe, we have the imaginary 3D space that you, where your Geist field of, of the magnetic uh, component here manifest. And then the negative uh, mass of that electron will and, uh, manifest 180 degrees out of phase with our, with our universe here. That's the negative energy universe. Now you also know on this diagram that Einstein's uh, general relativity theory can only manifest in real 3D space using only a half a dimension uh, of time. In other words, the time forward component. But the time reversal component can only manifest in, in this negative real 3D space, okay? So if you wanted a complete model of Einstein's general theory of relativity, you would have to incorporate it as uh, this negative 3D space and with the full dimension of time where time can run forward and reverse. And when it runs in reverse, it's in the negative energy universe. Okay, so the next slide, demonstration. So what I'm gonna do right now is switch off um, sharing and then go to a little demo here of what I'm talking about. Okay, here we are. 
Okay, now the 3D space that I'm talking about here is that when, when you look at a coordinate system, you have X, Y, and Z, okay? Now what we're saying here, when we look at the energy, let's say the positive energy would manifest, let's say this vertical dimension here. So you have three dimensions here, three here, and then three dimensions here. And you notice in the imaginary plane here, we're 90 degrees out of phase so that the imaginary universe is now 90 degrees out of phase. And then the negative energy universe would be 180 degrees out of there. And it's entirely accessible through the electron just by changing that phase angle. And so that's what this technology is doing here, is that um, when we look at positive energy manifesting here, when we apply torsion, when we apply torsion to the electron, causes the electron to rotate just by using torsion into the imaginary plane and then start to manifest into the into the universe that's 180 degrees out of phase with ours as negative energy, okay? Just by applying torsion to the electron. So that's the depth of that. Let's go back to the, um, Okay, now we also see this phenomena occurring with tunnel diodes. And with tunnel diodes, when you start to increase the voltage across the tunnel diode, you see the behavior of the electric current changes and so from zero to v1 you see a positive energy now what's very interesting about this is that quantum mechanics they do not want to touch negative energy it's just it's just off limits to them so what they did is kind of like a, a bait and switch here he said, rather than discuss negative energy, they're gonna call this negative resistance. And so that's what we saw with the S2 and mercury is that the negative resistance effect is really a distraction, okay? To get you to look here, but not over here. The not over here is the negative energy, which is really what's occurring uh, in these circuits. And so what we see here is that from V1 to V2 is what they call this negative resistance region. It's really negative energy that is occurring here. And so what we see in this negative energy region is that the flow electron greatly increases uh, rather than in the, in, the, in the positive region, let's see, positive energy region from V2 up to the breakdown voltage of the diode, that would be the positive energy region. The negative, this negative energy region, the flow of electrons greatly increases. And that's the phenomena that's occurring, the same phenomena occurring, okay, with mercury in these fluorescent tubes. And uh, I would say it's the same phenomena occurring um, in these ARVs as well, okay? So we had this region of ne negative energy and all it is is another force acting on the electron to create this quantum tunneling effect. And it greatly speeds up the electron flow. See, one of the problems when you deal with tunnel diodes, and I, I did some work on them back in the 1980s. You really can't get them anymore here in the US uh, the parts uh, that I have were made in Russia. 
so you'd have to order these diodes from Russia. But the uh, but what they have is that if you don't design the circuit correctly, there's a parasitic oscillation that occurs in these diodes at very high frequencies. And that's due to this quantum tunneling effect of negative energy causes it to oscillate or self oscillate at ultra high frequencies. And so you actually see the speeding up of the electron flow in the circuits. And so that's that's the negative energy effect is a speeding up of electron flow in that negative energy region. Okay, so um, what I did is I'm, I'm kind of a student of Don Hodson and you'll see a, a his papers were published in Infinite Energy magazine um, almost 20 years ago. And they are available on, on uh, academia.edu's where I have his paper posted. And, um, and Don, Don Hansen, his take on all of this is that there's really only one stable particle in, in the universe, and that's the electron. And so the charge on the electron can either, charge can either be positive or negative. And so in this case, we would have a time forward positive mass electron as E negative, but then the counterpart of that, which was successfully predicted by Paul Dirac back in the 1920s was of course the positron. And the charge on the positron has a positive charge, which is the time reverse. That's the time reverse charge of a time forward charge that we have in our universe. But you can still have a positive mass positron, okay? but the charge is time reversed. So now what I did is, uh, you know, I'm taking a somewhat of a practical approach to this, which is what Don Hodson did in a lot of his work. I calculated what the moment of inertia is. Now you really can't find this anywhere uh, that I know of on, on, on the internet here, or you can't find a correct equation for the moment of inertia for that electron anywhere. So what I did is I had to back calculate what that moment of inertia is. And it turns out to be uh, the moment of inertia equals two times the mass of the electron times the radius squared, which is very interesting. The reason why you don't find this anywhere is that when you go and calculate what the rotational speed is, at, at the radius of that electron, it's something like 26 times the speed of light. And so when they, when they discovered this back in the 1920s or so, they basically threw up their hands and said, this is absurd, this can't be. Nothing can be faster than the speed of light, okay? It, this, this thing cannot be rotating at that speed. So they basically threw it away. They, they, they threw this away. So what I did is that I, I decided, well, let's keep this. You know, may, maybe this is really what's happening here. So that when I go and figure out all my calculations, they all fall in place. It's a valid calculation. When you go and compute with the mass of the electron based on this uh, moment of inertia. Now, what's interesting Everyone. about this thing is that we also have this virtual particle flux that exists in, in the vacuum. And we have two versions of it. And so the standard model says that we have electron and positron pairs that they manifest through a creation event. They manifest as separate electron and positrons. And we see that in accelerators. Well, what we're saying here is that 
There is no such thing as annihilation and creation events. That these electron and positron pairs exist in the vacuum. And they're everywhere. Okay, they manifest as what we would call the ether. And so the electron positron pairs, they, they don't annihilate and they don't uh, create. They're, they exist in the vacuum. And so they had this property. When you go and take a close look concerning how they rotate, is that you get a mass cancellation effect that occurs. And that mass cancellation effect is the counter rotating component of the electron positron pair. And the same phenomena occurs with Cooper pairs as well that Cooper pairs has a counter rotating component that cancels out the mass of this um, of the of these pairs. And then another demo just to show you this. I can do another demo here. Okay, so what I have are two two types of gyroscopes just a regular gyroscope here, and then a gyroscope where I counter rotate these, they're, they're epoxied together. And anyone can, can do this experiment. And so when we run up one, You get something called rotational inertia with this. So if you try to change the spin axis of this, you feel that there's a resistive force. And so what we're saying, there's an analog to this in regards to the mass of the electron, that this actually creates the mass of the electron, okay? The mass of the electron would be defined as a spinning vortex of an electromagnetic plenum that creates the electron. Now, when we come along and we counter rotate these electrons, for example, in, in a Cooper pair or in a virtual particle flux, we get something that very interesting what happens here. Okay, so we start these two up. And so what we see is that it cancels out the rotational inertia okay, of this spinning gyroscope. And that's what we see with uh, the virtual particle flux is a cancellation of the mass effect using counter rotating systems. So if we go back to our presentation here. Yeah, so we have these uh, two different particles that have been identified, electron-positron pairs and Cooper pairs. And that's where we see this mass cancellation effect occurring. Okay, next slide. Scalar energy. Uh, uh, Bill, look, let me jump in really quick. It looks like your screen share isn't up yet. You, you oh, wanna, yeah. I didn't. Uh, okay. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So if we go from here, this this slide here shows the two uh, virtual uh, particles here, identified as Cooper pairs and electron-positron pairs. Both have a mass canceling effect. Both are counter rotating. But you'll notice that the electron positron pair has a net charge. And here we see with the Cooper pair is that there's a charge cancellation effect. That's the difference between the two, but they're both counter rotating. So we cancel out the mass effect. Okay, so scalar energy. Okay, based on this calculation, when I derive this equation for the moment of inertia of the electron, 
I'm really tying the mass of the electron to to its to its spin, okay, to its rotation. And and that of course is given by this top equation up here. And so when I did the math on all this, see all the math still works. All the math works. And you're able to find what the self energy or what I call the what really the Higgs field is is this plenum that makes up or creates the electron. And, and of course, uh, shown on the left here is that this field that surrounds the electron is the Higgs field. And that's what gives the mass effect. It's like a spinning, I can describe it as a spinning vortex. And at the, at the radius of that electron, it's spinning something like 26 times the speed of light but that speed rapidly falls off. And that at a critical, critical distance uh, from that electron is where the speed of light uh, is derived from. So the speed of light is actually the interaction between the electron and the electron-positron pairs that form in a vacuum. And as electron-positron pairs would surround the electron, but at this critical distance from the electron is where you have the origin of the speed of light. Now, nothing can exist inside the electron because we know what the field equations are of this field surrounding the electron is, um, is the... Uh, the square of the radius. So you can't have anything on the inside of the electron. It has to be completely empty. If there was something on the inside of that electron, because of course physicists want to take particles and you want to fill them with something to give them mass, but that's not the origin of mass. Mass is on the outside of the electron along with the charge of the electron. It's all on the outside of that electron. If you had anything on the inside, it would collapse to a singularity, okay? If you had anything on the inside of that electron, it would collapse to a singularity just by the equations. The equations tell you that, that there can't be anything on the inside. So it has to be a hollow sphere, okay? All electrons, all particles have to be hollow spheres like this. Otherwise they would collapse in on themselves just by the equation that tells you that it would. Okay, so next, uh, next slide here. Okay, um, back around 2016, I was exhibiting at the Extraordinary Technology Conference in Albuquerque, and this fellow by the name of uh, Bob Boyce approached me, and he was looking at some of my anti-gravitational research uh, in this field. And he mentioned he was a tech hired into Area 51 as a problem solver back in the 1970s. It's like, okay, that sounds interesting. And his job was to uh, fix a problem with these ARVs. And the problem was is that you would get inconsistencies in the field, the gut, uh, you know, what I spoke about before, the Geiss field surrounding these ARV uh, craft. And he referred to this uneven field as creating this effect that's called inertia leakage. And he says it was killing the pilots on these ARVs because when he would do the rapid acceleration, when he didn't have a constant or a consistent field, you may have had holes in the field. It would create this inertia leakage effect. And this would ultimately kill the pilots. So his job was to come in and fix this problem with these ARVs. And so, um, I mean, I, I can't prove that he actually worked there. <laughs> this is a true story. But it seemed quite reasonable to me what he was talking about with this inertia leakage problem. That if you don't have a consistent field 
around these craft that allows our inertia to leak in into the craft and of course cause catastrophic effects with anything that's biological within these craft. Okay. So his job was to fix that. Okay, um, what I want to touch on today is uh, something that I'm currently working on, and they're called PCM resonators. And so, uh, well, what's a PCM resonator? Well, it's, uh, it's an acronym for a phase conjugate mirror, okay? And back in December 31st, 2020, you know, just uh, about a month ago, I filed a patent and you're looking at a picture of what's in the patent, okay? And what's in it is our SFT, the split flux transformer, hooked up to a capacitor. And of course that forms a uh, phase conjugate mirror resonator. Now, what I discovered was that it has to be in this configuration because what you have is the split flux transformer uh, with these two converging output coils okay they're they're wired in a converging mode where the inductance subtracts rather than add okay and so when it subtracts like this and when you hook it up to a capacitor it resonates at a specific frequency. And it turns out that this is the true free energy effect. If you're looking for free energy, this is the way to go it. Setting up a PCM resonator. Now, who spoke about this? Well, it was Tom Bearden back in the 1990s. He spoke about this in a lot of his lectures. And I happened to catch one back in 1997, um, where he presented a lecture on free energy and anti-gravity systems using these PCM resonators. Okay, so next slide. Examples of PCM resonators. Well, it turns out Nikola Tesla's magnifying transmitter was a PCM resonator. When you closely examine the diagram um, that Nikola Tesla provided, you'll discover that it is a PCM resonator. Another example would be the Floyd Sweet device uh, with the opposing coils and his um, uh, ferrite magnet configuration was a PCM resonator. Another example would be the Stanley Meyer water car. Um, he, he also used uh, these coils wired in an opposing configuration connected to a water capacitor. Um, then, of course, another example is the split flux transformer that I'm currently using. And you also find the same phenomena occurring in metamaterials. Uh, metamaterials uh, are also resonators as well. And there's certain resonating points that you find in, in the material itself, where you have a large, uh, a large uh, negative energy points, okay, points of resonance. And, they, and to get this phenomena to work correctly, it has to be in this resonant mode. And if we go back to the ARV that I presented at the beginning of this lecture, that's a uh, that's a resonant system, okay? With uh, with the Tesla coil, the capacitors at the base, producing this flux, and that flux is rotated, okay, into this imaginary dimension that we call a Geist field. And so that's what we're working with here. These are all examples of PCM resonators. And of course, Tom was, uh, there, there's, a, uh, there's a video out there, a YouTube video that explains this beautifully. Okay, what's going on with these PCM resonators. And it's a lecture given by Tom Bearden 
I think it was back in the 1990s at a psychotronics conference. Okay, so what's going on with these PCM resonators? Well, what you have is this configuration of pump waves, wave one and wave two, uh, acting on uh, what, what Tom would call a nonlinear medium. Well, that it turns out that the nonlinear medium could be uh, just the vacuum itself. It's like you don't need any material there uh, to get this phenomena to work. Uh, it's just that um, in, in the split flux transform, for example, I'm using a met glass material, okay, as a nonlinear uh, material here. So you get this converging wave pattern acting on this material, wave one and wave two. And then you input into this PCM system a time forward signal wave, W3, and you get back a reflected component of wave four of what you put in. Now, ideally, this reflected component would completely cancel wave three. So you could be inputting energy into this system and getting negative energy coming back. Now, this is negative energy, okay, wave four, is what we call a phase conjugate replica transverse wave of the input signal, okay? That's what we get reflected back. Okay, so what are these devices doing? Now, typically we're all familiar with this top schematic, this typical device where you input power, let's say you input a kilowatt, you output um, maybe a little less than a kilowatt into a load, and then you dissipate some heat. Well, the same phenomena occurs with the PCM resonator as well. But the difference between the two is that you have this reflected component due to this pumping action that you have um, of negative energy returning back to the supply. So, you, so really, we're building a typical device, okay? But the difference between the two is that we have this input side that has this reflected negative energy component. And this negative energy component is shown in this diagram here, showing the PCM wave function, is that the time forward input shown as, as a solid wave, the dotted wave is the reactive time reversed EM wave due to that pumping action back to your source. So that when you add the energy of those two waves, you could be inputting, let's say, a milliwatt, but yet I'm still supplying a kilowatt input. But the time reflected component could be 999 watts of power being reflected back as negative energy, but you're still driving a kilowatt load with this, okay? This is what's so amazing about this technology is that we get this reflected time reversed output that's coming from this device along the input side of this, um, of this device. And the two equations they add. So again, you know, I wanna say that you can have a milliwatt coming in and a kilowatt out and that's what you would actually read on your meters. All our meters would read that. A milliwatt in and a kilowatt out. Okay, now I wanna to touch on what Tom Bearden was talking about here. Because if you use the heavy side equations of the Maxwell equations, everything's moving at the speed of light. 
So the problem is, is that you can't really equate something that's moving at the speed of light to general relativity, because general relativity is talking about something that is stationary, okay? And this is what Tom Bearden was emphasizing, is that if you use a standard vector solution like you have in the heavy side Maxwell equations, when you do this operation, and this, this is the pumping action, okay, we're doing with, with if we apply our two vectors of, of pump waves, that when you take the cross product, okay, of these pump waves, you get a zero vector and nothing else. And, and this is why heavy side electro, uh, electrodynamics or Maxwell equations would be incomplete, okay? You cannot get anything gravitational out of it or anti-gravitational. It really can't explain what these devices are doing adequately. So what Tom says is that you have to go back earlier and use quaternion math to solve this problem, okay? And so this is, this is how he did it. And Tom Bearden, he covers this in his uh, video lecture uh, quite well. He, he does a pretty good job with it. So we describe as one of these vectors, Q, and we represent it as a quaternion uh, representation. And then when you take the cross product of that same vector, you still get the zero vector solution you would have in your ordinary heavy side equation. You still get this zero vector, but then you have this other scalar component. And this is what Tom was emphasizing here, is that you get the full gravitational equation here using quaternion math to solve this problem. So that when we go and simplify this cross product of this pumping action, we see that we have a squared plus the zero vector. And so that when we apply a sine wave, for example, okay, to our device, we, we apply, it, it could be any frequency here. Um, when we apply our sine wave equation, sine of omega t, and set this all equal to Q, we discover that when we take the cross product of this, we see the internal structure of the zero vector. And that's how Tom Bearden describes what the zero vector is really doing. And he calls it a vacuum engine. And that inside the zero vector, is that you have the scalar wave function of a squared and sine squared omega t. And so um, Tom says, well, this is your scalar wave right here, which is a local gravitational wave. So you can only solve this problem using quaternion math of finding out what the zero vector really contains and that you really have this, uh, this function, this scalar wave, and it's a pumping action on, on whatever, whatever media you're acting on here, okay? And that that pumping action, when you hit, hit it with, um, with the wave that comes into this nonlinear material. Let's go back up to here. Right here with wave three, you then get this transverse wave here that comes out, okay? That's time reversed. It's negative energy that appears on the same circuit, okay? That's producing this, this pumping action here. Um, and, and it turns out that, that this is where you get the milliwatt coming in and, and the milliwatt come, or the kilowatt coming out 
the milliwatt is the addition of that transverse uh, time reversed uh, wave function. Okay. So that that's how that works. Okay, so uh, just to reiterate here, the scalar wave and this the Tom Beard scalar wave theory is really this pump wave action producing a local gravitational wave um, that, that's being manifest here. Okay, so PCM resonators. We're gonna run the test on this. This is actual data. And this would be as if you hooked up actual meters reading the RMS values um, of the input and output. We see that we have uh, with a frequency of 200 Hertz into the split flux transformer uh, into, um, I, I think that's 10 microfarads or so capacitor. We're just hooking up, we're just measuring voltages and currents. That's all that we're doing here with a frequency of 200 Hertz. I'm using uh, the scope here, the 2024B, which is an excellent scope, by the way. You know, I highly recommend these are isolated channel um, uh, scope and um, they work extremely well. And so the, uh, the voltage, RMS voltage, 6.87 volts coming in, uh, 0.22 amps, output voltage 21.31 volts RMS with an output current 0.27 amps. So we're seeing uh, input power of uh, uh, 1.44 volt amps, output power of 5.78 uh, volt amps. So we have a multiplication gain of about 3.76. So again, this PCM resonator here it's reflecting back, uh, if you were to, to take the power difference here, uh, th this is the power that's being reflected back of, uh, and, and given us this power gain of 3.76. So this, this is exactly what we're talking about here. You know, like the Floyd Sweet device, for example, you had a milliwatt coming in, a kilowatt coming out. You know, you had a, a phenomenal power gain, and that's due to how well these output coils are balanced, okay? So you want to get the inductance of these output coils to balance. If you want them to balance perfectly, the inductance would have to be near zero, okay? When you go and try and measure the output inductance of these two coils, even though individually they read about uh, maybe 30 millihenries, when they're wired up in this configuration of, of a PCM resonator, they subtract rather than add. And when they subtract, you want to get that number close to zero as possible. Okay. And so that, that would increase the power multiplier of these devices uh, quite high. And of course, uh, Floyd Sweet had his device uh, tuned to, uh, I think about a million or 10 million to one, okay? So you can end up with phenomenal power gains here. Okay, next slide. Um, back around 2005, I wrote a paper uh, it's published over there in um, academia.edu is where I have this paper. It's Newtonian torsion physics. And this is how I ended up uh, using rotation of those electrons in torsion. Okay, to rotate from our universe, positive energy, into a negative energy. Uh, the torsion is in this paper. And it's over there at academia.edu. And there's a, a lot of interesting information uh, that I presented in this paper as well. Um, I talk about uh, new properties of the electron governed by inverse square laws. Yeah, we're drinking um, UFO beer. A classical solution to quantum tunneling. The Biot-Savart law embodies special relativity. 
believe it or not. Um, sure the Biosavar law was written back in the 1830s and it embodies special relativity. It's built into that equation. Um, just by changing the phase angle of the electron, we call that torsion, creates the quantum tunneling effect. And of course, the outside of the electron uh, is of course what I call the Higgs field. Okay, so um, I came up with uh, you know applying torsion, and you can apply torsion uh, to various components uh, that we find in, in, uh, in equations here. And all it is is Euler's formula, okay? Applied to uh, the moment of inertia, angular momentum, the energy, um, the mass of the electron. So that's done in this slide here. Uh, the standard model of physics is destroyed. Uh, this Russian fellow wrote this paper and he shows that all particles in, in the accelerators uh, that are known can be replaced with fast moving electrons and protons, which are stable fundamental particles. So he's saying all, all the artifacts that were discovered uh, in these particle accelerators can be explained um, as electrons and protons. And of course, in Don Hodgson's universe, there's really only one fundamental particle in the universe. The rest are just manifestations of the virtual particle flux and electrons with uh, positrons being the time reverse charge of the electron. And that is my presentation. That's what I presented today. And so there's our website. I'm with ISA Industries. And um, that is my presentation for today. So I want to thank Tim for giving me this opportunity. Wonderful. Well, Bill, let me, before anything else, let me thank you. That was an amazing presentation. Absolutely amazing. Well, it's so, real. <laughs> what can I say? Yeah, well, it was it was wonderful to see such an in-depth run run through on things and you know right. and being able to connect all of those dots. So before we do anything else, um, I, I am not gonna unmute everybody, but let me put it on gallery view and let's all give Bill an enormous applause. Great job, Bill. Thank you. Yeah, again, absolutely wonderful. Um, so let's move into our question and answer. And let me see, let me see if you're, okay. I'm gonna remove the spotlight from you. And uh, it, so in chat, uh, go ahead and start putting your questions in the chat if you'd like. And then I, I should go probably to Hector Serrano, who he mentioned a couple of things. Hector, did you wanna, did you wanna, Okay. Yeah, there I am. No, uh, listen, uh, in our own research, which is totally different than yours, uh, and by the way, great presentation, lovely. Um, in my own research, I, uh, I, was, I was saying that we actually saw exactly what you talk about. So if I may suggest for a simple experimental, uh, um, possible experiment for you is, we, we uh, rented a, um, the same thing that NASA was using for uh, gravity shielding, which is where actually we got the idea from. Um, we used uh, the same kind of uh, gravity meter, which they have way better ones now, uh, <laughs> but the Lacoste Rumbic uh, at, um, a gravity meter, it was sensitive enough that it actually detected a decline in the, uh, any, every time we energized our system, our device, it actually detected an actual dip in the uh, in the mass, which obviously the rest mass couldn't have been changing because it's a, it was a closed system, so we interpreted that to be a change in inertial mass or a change in and it was a negative change. It was not a it was not a positive gain. It was a negative. It was a dip, and as long as the system stayed energized, we saw that the system was Faraday caged, good distance. So it's something to think about if you guys want to see if experimentally you can uh, demonstrate that that. If, if what you're saying is true and what you suspect is true, then you're going to, these meters are sensitive enough in theory to actually see something. Right. 
Right, yeah, yeah, you'll see a change in mass. You know, what Tom Bearden talked about back in the 90s, um, he says that, you know, the scalar way, um, it penetrates everything. Oh, yeah. Okay? You, you really can't shield it. <laughs> it it's <all>. true. <laughs> That's, right. We also right. observe that. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, because it's, you know, it's, it's this pumping action, okay, that, that you get with, with these type of systems. Mm-hmm. And it penetrates everything. Yeah. And so, uh, like, like what we did with our PCM systems is that you send in a positive energy wave and you get this reflected wave coming back of, of the time reversed of, of what you're putting in. And so we, we see this large power reduction. And of course, that's what's reported by all these other researchers as well. You know, we see yeah. Nikola Tesla, we see uh, Stanley Myers, um, Floyd Sweet. They all reported a big reduction uh, on, on the input side of this. Yeah, we, we, observed, so we observed similar things. Basically what we observed was the, the amount of thrust per unit power was ridiculously better than anything that you could conventionally approach. Right. So, right. And, and, and the kind of explanation you're talking about here is, is along the lines of what we, uh, what we have observed experimentally. And keep in mind that almost everything we've done has been strictly experimental. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, now, Tom Bearden mentioned back, back in the 90s there, is that when you see large scale free energy effects, you'll also see large scale uh, gravitational effects as well. Okay. okay. So the idea okay. is to improve the efficiency as, as high as you can get it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that you'll see a large scale anti gravitational effect occurring as well. I suspect that's that's exactly what's going on, you know. If you were to use mercury, or even using opposing magnets as well, um, okay. there was some research uh, done back in the fifties. Uh, Bill Lear, I don't know if oh, yeah. you ever heard of Bill Lear and Lear yep. Jet. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Heard a researcher by the name of Larry Wilson. Okay. Larry Wilson and his in, in his lab, he built a, a system using counter rotation. Okay. I figure, well, this is maybe something that the Germans were doing uh, with the Nazi Bell device. You know, mm-hmm. it's counter rotating opposing magnetic fields that breaks the entanglement that you have, broken entanglement, right. which, which gives you this anti gravitational effect and that. When you start to rotate the system, amplifies the effect. And so Larry Wilson, he built this device, and it turns out that this this one guy that gave presentations at the conference was a kid at the time back in the 50s, used to hang out in Larry Wilson's lab. Oh, nice. Saw what he was doing, okay, with this counter-rotating magnet system. And he was saying that, although he didn't see it, he did report that it floated off the ground, okay? Uh, It was just counter-rotating magnets. Now, Bill, if I can jump in. So our our next question, Hector, let me meet you back out. Our our next question was uh, Mark Fiorentino. Now, you were talking about torsion just a moment ago. Mark had had asked, mechanically speaking, how do we apply a physical torsion to the electron? Um, Mark, you with us? Do you, do you, want, you want me to unmute you if I can find you? There we go. All right. Okay. Okay, there we go. Yep. Yeah, just the question I just asked. Basically, I'm trying to figure out and visualize how you're, how you're accomplishing this rotation of, or torsion rea- uh, reaction to the electron. Right. Yeah, you set up opposing field action, okay? The magnetic field has to be in opposition to one another. This is where Tom Bearden, he spoke about uh, opposing fields, where you take the cross product 
of, of that opposing field action. And when you do so, you end up with the zero vector. The problem is, is that you cannot apply heavy side math to this. Okay, anything that's related to Maxwell equations after they've been simplified using heavy sides equations, you cannot apply that and get an answer to what you're looking for. Okay. Um, Tom Bearden used quaternion math to expose what's really going on in that system. And so what we're what we're dealing with here is what I call I, I call it a torsion field effect. So if you take two opposing magnets and you force them together, the physicist would tell you that, well, it's just field cancellation. You know, it, it's your zero vector that's coming into play here and nothing else. Well, there's nothing else in their equation, okay? But then if you go and look at Tom Bearden's quaternion math solution, you find out that that zero vector has structure in it, okay? It has, there's, it, it has a real scalar component associated with it. So you're not just canceling the field, you're setting up this, it's a system that's under stress. See, and that's why in general relativity, you know, you have your tensors, your stress tensors okay in place there because you're dealing with the system a static system that's that's under stress okay and 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 that's what tom bearden emphasizes so that, then wouldn't you doesn't that mean you would have to have a real existing ether for this to work um well yeah yeah um yeah you can't have something that's empty and and you're trying to do something like this because he needs something to transport, okay? Um, what, what's really occurring there. And so that, that's why I say that what physicists say is an annihilation and creation process is, is completely flawed, okay? There's no such thing as annihilation and creation events everything is still there in the ether it's just that directly measure it okay so if you have this mass cancellation effect going on with the virtual particle flux is that 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 virtual particle has no mass associated with but it's still there you know it's it's a system under stress the thing is is that the physics that we have today isn't going to tell you that Okay, that there's something there because it was taken out. You know, Heaviside, he, he took out all the, uh, the quaternion uh, components through his simplification process. And this is why Tom Bearden says, you cannot equate electromagnetism to general relativity. You can't do it. And yet we see physicists like Sarfati or Helpotov trying to equate electromagnetism to general relativity, you can't do that because the math in uh, the heavy side math tells you that there's nothing there, but yet the quaternion side, when you look at the complex side of things, tells you, yeah, there's something really there. Okay, you have uh, the stress, the stress field that's really there. And of course, you have to have an ether to be able to transport that stress. And the ether is there. You know, it's there as virtual particle flux. Okay. Well, well Bill. Now, let me let me jump in. Let me go to actually. Uh, so let me go to Eric Hermanson, and then I'll go to Jeremy Reese after him. But so Eric was asking if you could put up the the voltmeter slide again. Yes. And Eric, do, do you want, if I could find you, there we go. Do you have a question, sir? Sure. Um, thank you. Hi, Bill. Hi. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to see the, um, cause I missed uh, the first half of your presentation. I apologize. Um, 
And so some of these questions might not be uh, correct, but uh, I guess the first one is the input. So are the input power is, uh, the output power is almost four times greater than the input. Right. And, and so that's, um, that is usable uh, wattage. Yeah. In other words, I mean, uh, is, can you, can, can, you uh, can you charge a Tesla? A Tesla well, see, see, I, I, I have, uh, see, on the right side of that picture, you just see a little sliver of it. That's mm -hmm. a, a programmable AC power supply. Okay. And what I can do is sweep through the frequency to find out what the resonance is of this split flux transformer with the capacitor. I can find out what the resonance, the resonant point is. And that's the point of least power being supplied to that transformer and capacitor network, okay? And it's right around 200 Hertz. That's uh, what this is tuned to, okay? Okay. So at that tuned frequency, is where you start to see the amps. You know, as you sweep your frequency, you know, maybe you're starting off at 500 hertz or something, and you'll see that the current um, is actually very high. You know, it could be like an amp, maybe two amps, okay? Mm -hmm. So as you, as you start to lower that frequency to that resonant frequency at that point, you'll see the current start to drop okay to reach your resonant point of minimum current here and that's what we're seeing here a 0.22 amps so you're so you are resonating with the uh an lcr circuit where the capacitor right is okay now yeah, so it, it's basically an lc circuit you know so well there so there's no resistance at all um <clears throat> so i plug these i plug these numbers in and i i i see about a well i didn't do it right uh it's about a 30 ohm resistance now so so is this power well there's um, no resistor there you know it's just an well, LCD wires, circuit. uh so what are the gauge of the wires do you know the wires will have resistance oh they're just uh, what you see there are just the um normal cabling okay so okay. that's all that's there just maybe the, uh, uh 20 gauge i don't know yeah they're just um, jumper uh jumper cables so those so Patch those will have resistance which means that your um power output is potentially higher but what i'm asking i have two so the two questions are is this net uh, true net output uh, uh you know over uh, over input where you can literally uh, uh use the power to power a load for instance to charge up a, a tesla car with one with one quarter of the uh necessary energy input well if, that, if you set it up as an lcr circuit okay where you put a load on it as yeah. well yeah yes. it's still over unity okay it's still over unity we you still see more power out than what we're putting in Okay, because like you, you, you could go right to Elon Musk. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. The patent that we filed covers a, a DC charging system. Okay. Okay, that, that, that's operating this, um, this LC circuit in switch mode. Okay. So the idea is to run this at a fundamental frequency, a resonant frequency this LC in a flyback configuration where we see maximum or minimum input power, okay, but maximum output power. Right, so does it take time? How, how long does it take to get the, you know, I don't know how you can get it, like how long does it take to get to steady state? And to get this power well, multiplier right away, before. you know, it, it runs right away, right away, isn't in frequency, which is right around this particular circuit here is right around 200 Hertz. Cause you know, the, the capacitor is going to be charging up 
and um, and so if it you know if it takes a while you know so the capacitor is an energy storage device, mm -hmm. and then if it's connected to an inductor, then the current will go between an electric field and a magnetic field, you know it'll resonate back and forth, but the circuit is still going to be a charged uh, a you know, it's going to store energy. And so what I'm asking is how much energy, do you know how many joules of energy are being stored by, by the LC circuit? Well, it's very small. The joule energy is very small, but it's, um, but in this, this is, this is just a demonstration here. No, I understand that, but what I'm what I'm worried about. I mean, I'm not worried about it. What I'm what I'm uh, thinking is that you may be charging up the capacitor, and then, however, though, if you if you connect it to a load, you might find that the capacitor will j discharge, and your load will will uh, uh, gain energy. But then you'll have to put, you know, an equivalent additional amount of energy in. Uh, in other words, you're not you you won't have a net uh, a net uh, multiple of output energy. Um, I, I maybe I'm not under understanding. You know, I'm I'm throwing it out as a possibility. Uh, yeah. Well, see if you look at this circuit here. Okay, the uh, using a fluorescent tube is that we're running this transformer in a flyback. <laughs> And so, um, I mean, it, it's kind of similar to what we're doing here, except mm -hmm. rather than having um, uh, this negative resistance here, here we, we would have the transformers split flux with two uh, converging output coils. But we're still running it in a flyback mode. So you're putting energy into it and then the energy we get out of it is in this flyback configuration, but it's through a, a capacitor. Okay. Oh, so there's two. There's two inductors, not one. Right. So it's a it's yeah. a so uh, the inductors uh, have uh, to be an L two C circuit. Um, yeah. See, uh, I don't really show that in this slideshow here. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and the, the second. The second. Yeah. But it's, uh, right there. Sorry, I should mention we, we have a bunch of other questions stacking oh, up. I know, too. I know. I, uh, can I ask one last really, really quick one? You said negative energy is coming out. Can you explain right. what that means? And d does that just mean it's out of phase? or Because I, I don't know what negative energy it truly means. Um, yeah, it's, and, uh, it's this right here. Uh, this, this right here. PCM resonator. Mm -hmm. See, we're doing, um, if you look at the PCM resonator device, it's essentially the same thing as the typical device above. I mean, you're, I mean, in reality, you're still putting in a kilowatt. Okay, to get a kilowatt out, <coughs> you still have to put in a kilowatt. But what's being reflected back <clears throat> due to this pumping action that we have going on in the PCM resonator. Okay, you get this reflected energy wave coming back and that adds, okay, to your input wave. <clears throat> this is why- right, So I mean, what's coming not... out are just electrons though. I mean, like there, there's none of this like negative, you know, some people talk about negative energy in a different way, uh, but it's, um, yeah, anyway. well, it's a, it's a time-reversed replica wave. You find this in optics. I mean, this is for real, okay? But it's been very well studied in optics and acoustics of this phenomena, is that you have a time-reversed uh, replica wave being reflected back, okay, to your input source. And okay, that's thank you. you have... And oh, here, okay, this, this is your, uh, this is your phase conjugated mirror, okay, your PCM, and this shows the waves coming in. Wave one and wave two, those are your pump waves. 
okay? And this is what creates the stress in your nonlinear medium. Yeah, it has to be under stress in order to get this phase conjugated component to reflect back to your input. So your output is still, you're still outputting a kilowatt, okay? You're inputting a kilowatt, but then the reflected wave that's coming back is like what, 999 watts coming back? And those two waves can add, okay? Those two waves add. And when they add, you can have, when you read, when you read your meters, okay, when you read the power coming in, you say, gee, I'm, I'm only inputting a milliwatt of power and, and the output's a kilowatt. You know, what, what's going on here? Well, this is this, uh, this transverse replica phase conjugated wave that's coming back. And this is why we see very little power coming in with a whole lot of power coming out. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, now this is well known in optics. This actually occurs in optics and acoustics. Uh, Bill, so Bill, if it's okay, let me go to Jeremy Reese. He's had his hand up for a while. Again, I, I should apologize. We have a kind of a pile of folks asking questions. <laughs> so let me go to Jeremy next. Well, everyone's trying to understand this stuff. You know, it, it's tough. It took me 20 years. <laughs> hey, Bill. Uh, thanks. Thanks for presenting. Uh, look, I, I didn't get the message in time, so I only caught the tail end of this. So I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm piecing it together. And uh, we are live on uh, my YouTube channel now. Finally, uh, I got the. I was able to get the stream up for the last probably like five or ten minutes of your talk. So a lot of people are just tuning in live for this. Uh, we have about 60 people watching. Um, but. Um, I was I was watching and, and a couple questions popped out for me as uh, as the whole f a thing of negative energies. What are what are you what do you mean by when you say this thing creates negative energies and um, how are you measuring this? Well, this is <clears throat> you know I'm I'm not inventing <laughs> uh, anything here. You know I'm I'm kind of standing on the shoulder of of giants. And to me, a giant in the field would be Tom Beard. Okay, so I, I kind of picked up on what he was talking about. And believe me, it, it, it literally took me years to figure this stuff out. Okay, what, what's going on here? And this whole thing about negative energy, um, it is well known in optics, okay, about a, a transverse electromagnetic a wave that is a replica wave of what you put in. So W3 is your standard wave coming into this medium. And that what's reflected back is a time reversed replica of what you put in. And those two waves, they add, okay? They, they, they add. And when they add, you, you end up with something that looks like this. Okay, you have these two waves. One is your time forward input wave of, let's say, a kilowatt. Okay, let's say that I'm inputting into this device a kilowatt of power. But what's being reflected back, okay, through this device is a time reversed of that kilowatt coming in of about a little bit less because you're going to have losses in your system. Okay, all systems have losses. So it could be heat, you know, the medium itself, eddy currents, whatever inside your device, you're going to have losses. Okay, uh, now so built and reflected back could be 999 watts of power. Uh, Bill, let me let me go next. And again, I should apologize. I, I'm trying to kind of burn through these. So Todd Desieto had a, uh, he, he actually kind of a bunch of questions wrapped into one. Uh, Todd, are, are you with us? Let me have you ask this one yourself. I'm not sure if we can find you in the list. You have to Todd unmute Desiato. though. Todd Let's see what he has to say. He's actually yeah, on hey. our team. There he is. How's it going? Um, 
the uh, device you're you're talking about is a. Um, it looks to me like a ferro resident transformer. Uh, I used to design these and UPS inverter systems that drive ferro <laughs> resident transformers. So when you hook the capacitors to the to the coils like that, um, you're you're driving the capacitor into a resonant with the inductance of the coils, and then that resonance builds up to a a maximum, depending on the flux density of your inner, you know, inner linking core. So um, once that starts to saturate, the voltage doesn't go up anymore on the capacitor. But if you measure the current on the capacitor, it's very large. The VA volt amps on the capacitor is very large, but the watts are zero. And so when you tap off the transformer to to get a load that's when um well backing up a second when the capacitor is in resonance and you're uh feeding it the va on the capacitor is very large but the watts are zero and yeah that waveform transforms backwards to the primary side where your input current goes to zero because your watts are zero um, but you have this huge VA stored energy circulating in the capacitor. Well, then when you tap off the transformer to draw a load, you are going to be limited by whatever your transformer can handle and the capacitor can handle. And then at some point, the, um, the watts is going to completely collapse the resonance of the system. Um, you know, if the resistance is too low, it'll change the inductance and your resonance circuit will, fit, will fail. But um, the, uh, at no time does the watts input exceed, the watts output exceed the watts input. The VA on the output could be much larger than what you measure for watts on the input. So without that phase angle in your data, it's meaningless. And I don't mean to be insulting. I just, I, I understand this intimately. Okay, well, this was why we operate these transformers in a flyback mode. Doesn't matter. I, I've run them in full bridge, half bridge, uh, push pull. Doesn't matter. This is what's going to happen. I, I would agree with Todd, and it's sort of, uh, he kind of answered my question for me in the next part that I was going to uh, ask before I got cut off, and that was uh, that these, these flyback converters, it's basically, you're only changing volts for milliamps in, in these buck boost converters, so it, it, there's, no, uh, there's no free energy out of it. Yeah, yeah you, when, whenever you're dealing with the resonance circuit, <laughs> you have to be extremely careful to measure your phase angle between the voltage and the current. Just measuring volts and amps is insufficient because without the phase angle, um, like like you said, you, you're measuring it, you're describing it perfectly. You've got a huge VA on the output and your input current goes to zero. That's the way it works because you've got all this stored energy in the capacitor circulating. I, I don't want to take up any more time. Thank you. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, this is the, uh, the actual test data of what we see here. Oh, another question I would have is, um, is the output being hooked up to a, uh, oscilloscope so you can see the actual waveforms? And are they uh, a clean AC? Uh, yes. um, also had a question from Greg Chase. We are uh, doing this live on uh, my channel as well. We got started from the very beginning. And he wanted to know... One second. Um, does Mr. Alec know that inertial drag changes along the gravity field vector of a planet compared to open space? He's asking about the gravity field vector of a planet versus open space. Okay. Uh, 
do I know anything about that? No. Okay. Um, also, uh, I wanted to ask about the ARV that you brought up earlier, the spinning aluminum disc and the coil around it. What do you think that component of the, uh, the ARV diagram is uh, meant to uh, produce? <clears throat> okay, that would be right yeah. here. Yeah. Because that, that's, that's something that we're actually working on here in the lab. Um, I have an aluminum flywheel and an electromagnetic coil and spun it up and we were looking for weight losses and stuff but what do you what are your thoughts about that specific component of the craft and how does it operate within the craft theoretically okay yeah see my read on all this is that you know when you look at this drawing here um okay you can say okay well we have a, a tesla coil in the center column um capacitor plate on the on the bottom here and it's producing a very high voltage flux field okay around this craft um but the thing is is that there's nothing here to keep it stable in flight and that's where i feel this aluminum flywheel okay would keep this craft stable but the thing is, is that you're still gonna have, you know, what they call a propeller effect. You know, the craft is still gonna rotate in the opposite direction of rotation of this flywheel. So you're gonna have this propeller effect occurring here. Th that doesn't make any sense because if you're gonna, if you want something to stabilize a craft, you'd use a heavy metal like iron or steel or you know, something, or tungsten even, I mean, you can use the aluminum for the center part of it where the uh, mass doesn't make that much of a difference, but a, if it's really a flywheel, in, you know, for stabilization like they have on boats, they use a very heavy metal and a thick uh, bar on the edges in order to um, maximize the stabilization effect. Okay. And if you, and if you had a problem of the, uh, the rotation, you'd have two of them, you know, counter-rotating. Right. So um, that, that theory doesn't make that much sense. I, I was going more in the lines of uh, Frederick Alzafon. He said that it um, can induce a state of dynamic nuclear orientation by pulsing the electromagnet coils. And that's, that's something that we're working on here in the lab. And I'll show you that a little later. So um, I have think that would stabilize the craft? No, it would make the craft weightless close it's one of the uh key components to what makes this craft fly okay okay well mark let me let me go to jeremiah jeremiah uh are, are you with us yeah yeah i'm here okay and uh i have a few questions for you bill about the test device that you built so if you want to shoot forward in your slides um so the the device that you're measuring in order to look for the effects um the high energy out versus energy in um now that's a that's a PCM system. I was wondering how these components play into creating effectively an electrical version of a phase conjugate mirror. I mean, what part of this is is creating this phase conjugation? I guess I was confused by the the physical components versus the concept that's in place. I just didn't connect how these components are producing that effect. Well, the output gain of this is controlled by how balanced uh, th these output coils are. Okay, to set up a uh, a converging network and that the inductance of these output coils actually they, they subtract when you when you hook them up to a meter the output coils the inductance subtracts uh, so you're effectively you're you're saturating the magnetic material there I'm guessing it's laminated iron or, or some kind of transformer metal well it's a metallic material neck glass okay so it has a really high uh really high permeability really high flux uh capability then right is it fast fast material oh yeah and i'm guessing it also has a really strong bh curve transition where it's mm -hmm. uh it goes through saturation and has these nonlinear effects yeah it's it's very good uh material it's made by <laughs> hitashi and it's called neck glass wow. yeah i've heard of neck glass this material quite a bit in his uh research in his meg right yeah 
Okay, that, that makes a lot more sense. The MIG, a, uh, to me, the MIG was a, a, a switched uh, reluctance type device, which I think was a departure away from uh, these PCMs. So this device probably wouldn't work then with standard transformer lamination iron then. It would have to have a nonlinear oh, type no, of magnetic. Oh, no, it still works. It does? No, it okay. Worked. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've okay. used um, on this device here uh, permaloy. Permaloy works uh, uh, quite well as well. By magnetic sinks. Yeah, that is a good material too. Uh, I have yet to pick up a, a small spool of that stuff. I was looking for some one-inch strip, but they won't, they won't sell it to me directly unless I buy 500 pounds of it. So unfortunately, mm. I have no idea where to get this stuff uh whatever you're using there though i might want to ask what what material that was and how you got it in such a small strip size in a small quantity because that would be very nice to work with for a variety of other applications relating to this technology right yeah yeah it's made by hitachi and it's a uh, met glass material all right awesome well that that helps clarify what's going on then thanks bill mm -hmm. but now you know i operated this resonator is also uh under load as well and so uh, it's still over unity when I put a load on this. That's pretty fantastic. Okay, well, so let me let me go to Sean next. Uh, Sean, you've had your hand up for quite a while, sir, and I should apologize. Yeah, no worries. Uh, could you explain uh, inertia leakage a little bit more? Um, and have you they found a way of preventing it? Okay, that would be this fellow here, Bob Boyce. Yeah, he approached me at the uh, Extraordinary Technology Conference back in 2016. And he said he was hired in to solve this problem of inertia. He called it inertia leakage. And it came about as, as not having a perfect field around the device. So that, so what happened is that when the device would lift or float, and you make a rapid acceleration, if, if, if the field is not consistent or it has holes in it in the field, that allows leak, uh, inertia to leak into your machine, your ARV. And he says that it, it would ultimately kill the pilots. And so his job was to fix this problem of inertia leakage um, you know if i could jump in if i could jump in real quick and i apologize sean and bill it, it sounds like this bill this would apply when you say arv in this context this would apply to any kind of vehicle like this right so this would be your tr3b or your god knows your stealth blimp your ufo any kind of vehicle that that has some kind of inertia modification would probably have the same potential issue right right mm -hmm. that, that was why i really wanted to bring it up because i figured that'd be very important so uh thank you for answering that absolutely okay so let me let me see who is next i'm scrolling through our questions uh let me see and so uh there's ben mcmahon um a lot of these are kind of been answered already uh Jeremy, did you have another question? Yeah, I think I'm understanding a little bit better uh, maybe what's what's going on with um, Bill's machine now. Um, someone pointed out in the chat that the, the analogy of um, that third coil being like a, a swing and that, you know, a swing, if you hit it with the right resonant frequency, you can keep pumping energy into that swing. And um, if you can keep pumping energy into a swing like that, you can you can easily pump it up to uh, energies where you can get, um, you can go over the bar, so to speak, and that's when you get nonlinearities. Um, and that's where the, like, our conventional laws of physics and stuff break down. Um, is is uh is that is that would that be a good description uh for the layman out there of what's going on oh bill and that would be uh, so i think i think what jeremy was asking was yeah it, okay sorry about that okay um well the 
you see the pumping action if you look at the uh, the split flux for example the pumping action occurs um, on the input side of this you have a primary coil on the in, on the input side and then you have two output coils and then you see that th there's two met glass cores on your input side and that's what's that that's your pump that, that's your pumping action along with your signal wave coming in to this it's also creating a pumping action of flux uh in in your system here so that uh, uh if we go to uh this diagram here your wave one and wave two would be your flux action uh occurring uh from from the primary side creating this wave one and wave two of your pump and then the input is your input power into this device and so you get something that looks like this right here you get this um, uh, this reflected wave that comes back out which reduces your input power And do you have a description of the boundary conditions uh, for that reflection and transmission coefficients? Um, it's really a function of how these output coils are balanced. Uh, when I go and measure the, uh, the inductance of the output coils, one might be uh, 31 millihenries and the other one might be um, 30 millihenries. Okay, so they're not perfectly balanced at all and so when you go and operate this uh this coil arrangement you see that the inductance the overall induct output inductance drops to maybe 10 millihenries and that's due to the imbalance of those two coils okay so if they if they were perfectly balanced you wouldn't have any induction at all Okay, and in a way, that's what you're really looking for. You know, in order to increase the efficiency of this device, you want the output coils to be as closely balanced as possible. And that's what would give you the maximum amount of uh, efficiency in, the, in this type of system. Awesome. So, okay. So all that all that would really do is just uh, increase the negative energy component being reflected back, because you want to get your input power as low as possible. But if your system is unbalanced, then of course you're going to have um, not as much negative energy coming back into your circuit, and that's why we end up with uh, you know something that looks like this on your uh, input power versus output power. Because the input uh, input power, sh the, the input side should be as close to zero as possible. So your input current should be close to zero, okay? Oh, uh, Bill, so let me go next, uh, let me see. Let me go next to Jean-Francois Genest. Uh, Jean-Francois, let me see. Ah, and he he was asking, um, well, sir, do, do you want to ask yourself or uh, there we go. Very, very quickly. So you said that uh, you are positive in energy and that you have a kind of a creation of energy in your system, even when it is loaded. Did you try to loop it back in order to have kind of a perpetual motion? Uh, what was the question again? Oh, oh. sorry. I, 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 he, he's asking, have you ever tried to feed back the loop to create kind of perpetual motion? Basically, have it feed itself. Um, well, that's not the way these devices work. You have to have an input power source and then output power as a load. And the way that these things work is 
Okay, uh, with this diagram here, let me uh, put this on share. Okay, yeah, you see with this diagram here is that you're still inputting a kilowatt of power, okay, in your typical device and you're driving a load with it. And so we're all familiar with, the, with, with these type of devices. And then of course you have some loss in your system. But with these uh, PCM resonators device, uh, devices, what I discovered was that you're, you're still supplying a kilowatt coming in, all right? To drive a kilowatt load, you're still like a typical device. But then when, uh, but, but then with this PC, uh, PCM resonator technology here, you have this reflected component that comes back on the input side to subtract what, what you're inputting into, in, into your resonator device. So if you're putting in a kilowatt of power, you might be getting back, let's say, maybe a negative 500 watts. And so when you, uh, when you add the two waves, okay, if you have a kilowatt coming in and 500 watts coming back out, you're still inputting 500 watts. Then. And that's what you're gonna read on your meters. Your meters are gonna read 500 watts coming in and a kilowatt coming out, okay? But your reflected component's 500 watts. Let me reformulate then my question. Uh, you get more energy output than input. Uh, yeah, but that's what it looks like, okay? You're still inputting, you're still inputting a kilowatt of power. Uh, okay. No, you put one kilowatt of power, but you get 500 watts less. Right. You're inputting 500 watts. Yeah, okay. you see, that, that's how these PCMs work, is that you get a reflected component coming back of, of negative energy. But what do you do with this uh, negative energy? It just comes back and subtracts from your input power. That's all it does. Yes, so you, if I, uh, to, to be sure that I understand, for example, if you have 500 watt max of negative energy, you input 500 watts of positive energy and your load is loaded as if it received one, one, uh, one kilowatt. Well, you see if, see, if we didn't have this capacitor here and you were doing these measurements, you would not see numbers like this at all. Yes, you would still I'm... see a lot of power coming in and a little bit of power coming out. Let me, let me maybe reformulate this. Imagine that your load is a pure resistance and a, a heater. So if you load 100 kilowatts, uh, one, one kilowatt, sorry, you will have some heat for one kilowatt in, in a, a specific uh, chamber with no leaks and so on. And so you would input for some time 500 watts on your side, and then your load would dissipate one, one kilowatt of heat. Do I understand well or not? Right. Did you test this? For, for how long? Um, well, we tested this uh, as an RLC circuit as well. We, we, we put a load on this output. And we still see that uh, we're, we're still over unity uh, when we put a load on this output right here. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Jean-Francois. Uh, let me see, oh, there, Jeremiah has another. Jeremiah, do you have another question? Yeah, I do, to, um, okay. to elaborate on the last question. So there is this thing called effective power measurement, which is if, you, if we were to take up the voltage and the current at any given point going into or out of the circuit and you were to just take that measurement of voltage and current, um, and slice it up into tiny little segments, say 500,000 measurements per cycle. 
and you were to calculate out the actual power draw between voltage and current at every given point, then you would have your effective power measurement, which is going to be significantly different than your uh, than your volt amps. You know, your watts and your volt amps are two very different things because one has phase involved in it and the other one does not. So the question is, um, is this really uh, more of a way of tricking the meter or does this device genuinely consume effective power wise less than it's generating on the output? Okay, well, let's go to the, see if we hooked up our meters to this, our, because our meters are just gonna read RMS. Well, right, but your meters can read effective power, which is why, you know, anytime you read an RMS measurement with a system that is out of phase, you're going to get a really screwy number, especially with the standard power meter. So um, power meters will lie to you about all these types of measurements, which is why I'm asking, have you done anything beyond using a standard power meter to specifically take into account the phase difference between voltage and current and know that uh, that your measurements are accurate? Well, just that uh, we, we hooked this up under a load. We, we put a load resistor on the output of this. Right, but the trouble is that if you're using that type of equipment, you may be getting erroneous test measurements. And uh, we've seen this all the time in the calibration industry. Your uh, power meter may not be capable of taking the type of measurement uh, spot for spot and splitting up into multiple different segments where voltage and current are compared to each other, not during the entirety of the cycle, but um, one, one measurement at a time, several thousand or uh, several hundred thousand times per cycle to guarantee you have effective power measurements correct. And that so, you're not just... Jeremiah, it, it sounds like, and I think I think this is kind of building up, kind of, um, you know, I, I think other folks have asked about the load. So it sounds like probably a, a next step then, you know, would, would just be increased testing, right? Test this on a variety of different loads. But what are some loads that you might suggest, recommend? Was that to me? Yeah, oh, yeah, uh, it's, yeah. it's more on the input side. It's not so much on the load. The load we can easily measure, as, as was stated through a resistance, that we measure the amount of dissipated power. Measuring the output power is the easy part. Measuring the actual input power where your voltage and current are out of phase is much more difficult. And for that, you need something like a DPO 5000 or a 6000 series oscilloscope, which has effective power measurements built into it. And then you need to monitor the voltage and current on two separate channels and have the scope do a mathematical calculation between those two, giving you a comparative analysis. But a regular watt meter is not going to have that kind of resolution, that kind of sampling capability. It's going to take average measurements over a longer period of time, and as a result, you're going to get erroneous readings on the display. Mm, okay, okay. But I, I, I mean, it, and then obviously something? you'd be able to, like, yeah, I think Jean Fren Swan mentioned putting this on like a, a like a heater too, right? Yeah. So you can put. Yeah. Resistive load is effectively a very good way to guarantee that your voltage and current into that loader are never going to be out of phase because of inductance or capacitive effects. It just eliminates that out of the equation, which is a nice way to test the amount of power you're actually generating. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, that's yeah. something I was bringing up before. If you're actually changing the waveform, then you, it's much more difficult to read the total watts input because. Uh, with with simple DC, it's amps times the voltage. But with AC, you're assuming that you have the same waveform on both sides in order to use that same equation. Uh, but if the, if the waveform change, that that equation's out the window. You can't use it anymore to uh, determine the watts. Okay. Well, so I think Bill, I think we're almost out of time. I want to thank you again very very much for your presentation. Thank you for spending all the time for the Q and A session. So again, everyone, let's put our hands together for Bill in this incredibly detailed presentation. Thank you again, sir. Thank you. Thank you okay. for giving me the opportunity here. Oh, absolutely. And thank you for joining us, Bill. Okay. Uh, so let me see. Let, let me go, let me see if David Chester is with us. There, there he is, there, and right in the nick of time too. Okay, and David, let me find you on our list. I should apologize, this is quite a lot to uh, scroll through. Uh, Hello. We... Yeah, David. Perfect. Hey, how's it going? Just Wonderful. Coming in on time. 
Yes, thank you very much, sir. Okay, well, if you're ready to present, let me hand it over to you. And uh, if you wanna share a screen for your PowerPoint, I think you should be able to do that. I'm gonna mute myself out now. Great. So can everyone see my screen? We can see it. We can see awesome. it, David. Awesome, thanks for the feedback. All right, awesome. Well, is this showing the main screen? I think I need to switch the display sweating. There we go, is that better for everyone? Does everyone look like they're seeing the same, the right screen, the big one? Yeah. I no, see you some look nodding heads. All right, yep. great. So I'm gonna move this over here and then I'll get started then. So thanks to uh, Tim Ventura for giving the invite for this talk. Today, I am going to discuss anti-gravity in the most general theory of relativity. And I'll talk about what, what I mean by that. And uh, so I got a PhD in theoretical physics and now I work at quantum gravity research. Um, so I was asked to talk about anti-gravity and simplify it for the level of engineers. So I thought about what that meant and I thought about it in this term. So if you think about what an engineer is, we have mechanical engineers, they often study Newtonian mechanics and have to learn a lot about stress and strain. We have electrical engineers, they learn about Maxwell's equations and circuit theory, material science, they actually need to, they are engineers and they need to learn some quantum physics. So aerospace engineers, they really need to learn all of the above. So they need to know mechanical, electrical, a little bit of material science, fluid dynamics, hydrodynamics, thermodynamics. So if we're talking about being serious about anti-gravity and we wanna simplify it for engineers, what that means is we need to be able to teach quantum mechanics and general relativity to engineers. So that is what I'm going to try to do today. Oh, I love so this. So just to provide a little bit of background about uh, you know, myself. So I mainly study quantum field theory and general relativity. And quantum field theory is the most successful theory for describing uh, all of the forces of nature, quote unquote, besides gravity, but it's actually not as problematic as people say. So it's very successful for electromagnetism, uh, quantum electrodynamics, and also for uh, adding in special relativity. And the one of some of the biggest experiments on the globe right now uh, were the LHC, where they detected the Higgs boson. It obviously got a lot of news, a lot of money went into that. And then general relativity is the other big theory of gravity, and people are figuring out how to quantize it right now. And basically, LIGO is the other biggest experiment in the world, and they recently have detected gravitational waves. So uh, I, got an M, uh, I got a degree in undergrad in physics at MIT, and when I was applying to grad schools, I wanted to use Feynman diagrams from quantum field theory to calculate general relativity. That's what I said I wanted to do when I applied to grad schools. And everyone told me I was naive, but I got into one school because there was a professor there who had already computed these things. And I didn't even realize that people had already done this, but most people in the field didn't realize this. And he was able to calculate gravity from the other forces of nature, the strong force. So that's very curious. Uh, basically, what is the most general theory of relativity? Well, we know that general relativity uses Riemann curvature for its framework to describe uh, curved space-time, but the most general mathematics uh, for general relativity or gravity in general, uh, this differential geometry, there are more exotic types of geometry, and a lot of these are necessary for quantum gravity. And th this includes concepts like torsion coming from Cartan and non-metricity coming from Weyl and others. And basically, spinners are used to describe matter and in order to get angular momentum conservation we need the torsion and uh, some of these unified field theories right now are using non-metricity so it's pretty exotic stuff but we don't need to know all the details of this but i want to mention this because there are some interesting aspects of this theory that are contained that have effects related to anti-gravity that are not in general relativity that are related to some of the things that people in this area are discussing so I figured it'd be worth mentioning that. So I wanna take a very conservative approach to anti-gravity. I wanna be serious about it. I wanna bring some respect to this conversation. I mean, we have to be very serious when we're talking about doing this because it is very challenging. So if we're gonna think about metric gravitational engineering, we have to understand gravitational theory and we have to be able to work with it and understand how anti-gravity is coming out of it. 
realistically, we're going to use electromagnetic devices uh, made out of materials, and we're probably going to want to induce some quantum behavior in those materials in order to get the effects we want. Therefore, we're going to have to understand how quantum materials interact with gravity. And I think the best way to do that is to understand how quantum gravity works. That way you understand unified field theory. And if we can understand unified field theory and can look at how Maxwell's equations and general relativity play with, if we know that we have a unified field theory that is decent enough, then we can at least have some confidence in the theoretical framework that we're working with. If we're not even sure what quantum gravity is and we're taking quantum electrodynamics and adding it into gravity and we don't know how those play together, we might run into problems. So um, my goal today is not to suggest the, you know, the best way to do it necessarily. I just want to provide evidence to motivate further study of it from this perspective of unified field theory. And I just want to mention for the sake of humanity, uh, this analysis I'm going to present w was only really possible <laughs> by making friends of enemies. So I've been looking at a lot of different theories and a lot of different people's work. And a lot of times what I try to do is figure out if there's two people that disagree, what is the underlying framework where everyone can agree and be happy? And so I'm going to show you that perspective today. So just to give you uh, a little possible timeline about how maybe things could work, right? Maybe in the next decade, there's going to be significant progress in understanding quantum gravity and unification. Who knows? Maybe there could be some legitimate textbook that's actually written on how to combine quantum mechanics with gravity to do something like metric engineering for these types of applications. You know, who knows where that'll lead, question mark, but maybe it'll lead to a profit in the future. And I just want to mention that, you know, there's this idea of the Jetson. Jetsons, they came out in the 60s and they had this 100 year projection in the future. So we're, we're about halfway there. And so I just asked you guys, does it feel like we're halfway there with the technology? Something to keep in mind. So in nature, uh, I guess the most, I tried to pick the least controversial things that I could find that are helpful for trying to understand anti-gravity. One of them is dark energy because we find that galaxies are pushed apart and it's a gravitational effect. So it seems like that is a natural type of anti-gravity. Obviously we're not gonna be, that's not practical for engineering, but it's worth to try to understand that in the framework of general relativity, just to understand how something like this might work. Um, also, there's this notion of torsion <coughs> and very high spin densities, creating essentially a finite size for particles. And there's also the connections here to topological field theory. And so it's, it's sort of a type of anti-gravitic effect and so I think there is also this sort of analogy that you can make between this and um, the metamaterial effects. It's a little vague analogy, but I, I, I figured it's worthwhile to mention just because it is um, deep physics that is important for trying to understand quantum gravity. So the third topic I'm gonna mention at the end is this idea of pump metamaterials. Mainly I'm going to present ideas uh, from Jack Sarfati that I've just seen from email threads. And it just seems like the, he seems to be the only Oops, so it looks like we've had a uh, an accident over here. get that back up in a second is given this kind of it's almost like an imaginary dimension such that when we measure the distance in flat space time uh, the time adds a, this negative effect where space is kind of has a positive length and then in general for general relativity we have curved space time so there's this more general space time metric g mu nu and here I just depicted kind of this idea of having foliations of space-time, and you could imagine uh, being a particle traveling along a path, let's say in the z-direction, and at each moment in time, you're, you kind of have uh, two dimensions that are transverse to your direction of motion, So, and you could have curved space-time in general relativity, and that describes what gravity is. So basically what ends up happening is you have derivatives, there's calculus involved, in, obviously, and the derivative gets enhanced to what's known as a covariant derivative, and this also occurs in electromagnetism. 
So that's curious. And the, the covariant derivative involves this connection and this connection affects uh, geodesic motion and provides a fictitious force to describe acceleration. And this is the variable that goes into the curvature. I didn't even write down the exact formula for curvature, but um, the, the, the connection goes into the curvature. And so you can think of the connection as being sort of the potential and the curvature being a field strength. And so we have these different types of curvature. There's this four tensor because there's four space-time Lorentz indices here, but we can contract these indices. So we get this Ricci two tensor and we can further contract to get this Ricci scalar and Einstein's field equations combine the two tensor and the scalar with the metric into this field equation where we have the curvature on the left-hand side of the equation and energy, momentum, and stress and strain the electrom or, no, the energy momentum tensor is on the right hand side. So this is gonna be all the sources of gravitation, whether it be matter, electromagnetism. And what we're gonna focus on at the end of the talk is the coupling between energy momentum and curvature, this eight pi G over C to the fourth. So keep that constant in mind because we really need to get over this barrier. Um, that is the biggest problem is understanding, let's say we had negative energy somehow that's not, that's not even the biggest problem. The biggest problem is getting over this hurdle, which is what Jack Sarfati has really been addressing. Sorry, I meant to add some drawings here, but I didn't have time to get there. So uh, why is anti-gravity so hard? Well, basically we can look at this coupling constant here between matter and curvature, and it's astronomically small. I mean, Newton's gravitational constant is pretty small. And then we have a speed of light, which is pretty big, but that's in the denominator. And then we have it to the fourth power. So we have this huge number in the denominator to the fourth power combined multiplied by this other small number, giving this extremely small number. So even if we can find negative energy, we're gonna need a lot of it to curve space-time enough to have an actual effect. So if we're just tinkering around in our garage or if we're an engineer without knowledge of general relativity, I mean, you can hope that maybe you're gonna get maybe three orders of magnitude. I mean, that would be, amazing you know getting an order of magnitude and in increased strength is a big deal so if we're going to have to get it over numbers like 10 to the minus 43 then we really need to know what we're doing so what is meant by anti-gravity this is also important to talk about i don't mean something like magnetic levitation what we mean is this anti-gravitic effect would affect light and heavy objects proportionally because you know if you think about a rocket, you're gonna use jet fuel. If you have more mass, you're gonna need more rocket fuel. So the same sort of limitation occurs with magnetic levitation. So that's why it's not true anti-gravity. So we need to understand uh, what types of matter lead to efficient solutions such that we can control uh, the curvature of space-time itself to get these effects that uh, we want. And metamaterials are probably the best candidate because Metamaterials is just a, a, a blank term for exotic materials that have bizarre properties. And to understand how to do this, we really need to understand how electrodynamics and gravity come together. Um, so I'm briefly gonna go through unified field theory and particle physics. Honestly, most engineers don't need to know the details of this, but I really do think that the people who are figuring out how to bridge the gap between the science and engineering are gonna need to understand some deep stuff that are at this level of difficulty, but I'm gonna to try to dumb it down for everyone. So uh, we can think of types of anti-gravitational fields just in general that might occur in our universe. And we can see that there's the creation of matter uh, via extremal black holes in supergravity and string theory. And we're understanding how black holes are basically fundamental particles. And the particles, there's this notion of uh, renormalization where the particles actually get an effective size so we have these point particles, but really we have to realize that they're actually, they have some finite volume. So you can think of that process as sort of being an anti-gravitic effect that pushes things away to give it that finite size. Um, I, I find that a little bit helpful. Obviously this isn't practical, but it's important to understand how this works in my opinion. And also looking at cosmology, such as the expanding universe, this relates to the dark energy and how galaxies expand. So, I mean, if we have the theoretical understanding to address quantum gravity and these types of effect of, you know, extremal black holes and cosmology. If we have that theoretical framework and it's there and we can apply it to reality, then I think we might be ready to start 
opening the dialogue for how could we you know get realistic anti-gravity effects so at the end i'm going to try to get more uh realistic and talk about this idea of pump metamaterials and so basically for a unified field theory the the, the idea is that matter is sort of made of the same stuff as space-time you have this unified field where everything is the same object and so as i was saying you could think of point like singularities um, actually occupying some volume after you consider everything that's going on. So even if you don't study torsion, the topological field theory community also finds the same effects, but um, these are actually two sides of the same coin. So uh, I, I say this to say that there's differing opinions where people are studying different fields, but when you stand up above them all and see how they're connected, they're, they're pointing in the same direction. So this is kind of what I'm talking about where enemies, someone might study topological field theory and not care about torsion and not like that stuff, but they really actually do point to the same direction at the end of the day. So matter is creating these regions of isolation or these voids within space-time itself. And uh, this actually is relevant for thinking about how string theory and extra dimensions work because we actually think of ent the entire space-time as this type of brain world, which is essentially a material which is embedded in higher dimensions. So you can think of a fundamental particle as getting an excitation. And from our perspective, it's just a point, uh, but really there's some volume. So you could kind of think of the extra dimensions as being the topological information that is filling that void. That's one way to think about it. So I'm gonna spotlight a few uh, respectable scientists in this talk. One of them is Joel Shirk, because he was the co-inventor of string theory and supergravity. And he was the one who realized that string theory was a theory of quantum gravity. So uh, I also mentioned this because he wrote a paper on anti-gravity uh, a few months before he died uh, based, based on a tragic accident. But basically, uh, supergravity with this notion of extended supersymmetry has anti-gravity. It's a fact. And if supersymmetry does exist, you know, you could be skeptical. Is this is this a, you know do we should we even care about supersymmetry the point is even if if for in order for supersymmetry to work we need extended supersymmetry so it and extended supersymmetry is what has anti-gravity so not all supergravity theories have anti-gravity but the ones that are realistic have anti-gravity so that is interesting and it's curious so maybe we should listen to what these experts in the field are saying so i'm going to briefly bring you through the, the evolution of string theory very quickly so it started off with zero dimensional points in four dimensions. They did some mathematics and realized that there are these nice super strings that could exist in 10 dimensions. There are these one dimensional objects. And so they changed the parts of the strings and then they changed their mind. And they said, well, actually there's super gravity in 11 dimensions. And Ed Witten realized there's this M theory that unifies string, some, uh, string theory and, and super gravity together. And there they use these two dimensional membranes that generalize the string. So they're getting away from the point, they're getting away from the string, and now they're going to these membranes. And the story doesn't end there. Really what happens is there is this larger theory above M theory, there's a few different ones, and these are making contact with this three brain or three dimensional brain membrane, same thing. And there are these notions of F theory, S theory, and recently A theory in 12, 13, and 14 dimensions. And what is a three brain? What, what are we talking about? What are all these complicated stuff? A fast way to say it's a material. I mean, it's this three-dimensional object that fills up a volume and it occupies three dimensions of space and it's lifted to extra dimensions. So these extra dimensions, it's very simply just internal spaces for charge and other associated with other forces. So space-time is associated with gravity. We have other forces and we need to describe the conservation laws for energy momentum as well as the other charges and those extra dimensions are just there to allow for this unified conservation law. It's that simple. We don't have to get all mystical about what these extra dimensions are. So type 2b supergravity has uh, this three brain and M theory actually doesn't make contact with it. It's a little convoluted. It's, it's claimed that M theory unifies all the supergravities, all the string theories, but when you actually study it, it's a little comp convoluted the way it's connected. There's these chains of dualities. So and the, the super algebra of M theory doesn't actually contain all the super gravity super algebras and the physically realistic ones involve this three brain and so really getting back to this idea of something like an ether I mean they're just saying that there's this material and so 
it's not that new of a concept. So just to, just to establish myself. So uh, in 1997, this 14 dimensional idea was put out by Ishtek Bars, who's a very serious string theorist. And no one is really, this isn't really something you're gonna hear from many people in mainstream media because no one, no one's talking about it. I mean, it has a few citations, but in the past decade, really only me and my collaborators have cited this work. So not even the string theorists who are bad at communicating with the public are talking about this. So the chances of anyone hearing about this are very slim. Uh, but I'm gonna make it really simple for you guys. So we're in 14 dimensions. How do we describe this if we're in kindergartner? So I'm just gonna use addition, multiplication, and I'm gonna divide by two at the end. So I hope the engineers can keep up with me here. So this theory has 11 spatial dimensions, space-like dimensions, and three time-like dimensions. Uh, and you, you follow through the symmetry breaking, and you realize that you can break off eight uh, spatial dimensions into three plus eight. And then the three time dimensions, it's not that mystical or complicated either. It's just one time dimension with rotation angles for mass flavor oscillations. So in the standard model and beyond the standard model, we know that there's three mass generations of particles, like the electron, muon, and tau families. And uh, I figured out how this is related to the three time dimensions. And basically the, the eight dimensions here are related to the eight charge configurations. And basically if you're an electrical engineer, maybe you've heard of a Fourier transform, uh, momentum and energy is conjugate to space and time. And we know that equals MC squared. So that helps understand why the extra time dimensions are related to three mass generations. And basically charge is conjugate to this gauge degrees of freedom, these extra spatial dimensions, such that we see that really these, uh, these extra dimensions are just for this unified conservation law of energy, momentum, and charge. So uh, when we look at this theory and you study the spinners of it and you look what matter is involved, you get these eight charges with three different mass states. Okay, eight times three is 24, all right? We can do that math. And then if you look at the, the particle content, there's, um, Proportionally, there's three quarks for one lepton because you can have a red, green, and blue quark, but those red, green, and blue quarks have the same mass. So for four particles, there's two mass values, and the 24 divided by 12, uh, 24 divided by two gives you 12, and there's 12 different masses associated with the standard model fermions depicted here. So see, this is string theory, really, this is where it's going. It's connected to the standard model. I did not introduce any unphysical superpartners. This is reality and nothing more. Uh, so here we go, right? So now that we've established a unified field theory, we have quantum gravity. We can now talk about, we can get into the engineering a little bit, uh, but really just remember that we want that simple picture. Uh, and basically what happened is Lisi's E8 theory when appropriately formulated is really essentially related to appropriate formulation of Witten's M theory because Witten said M theory is an E8 gauge theory. So we had to make enemies friends here because Garrett Lisi was vague, but he, he was trying to get some simplicity and string theorists used E8 a lot, but they missed the simplest picture. All right, so now to try to get into anti-gravity, we have these fundamental particles at extreme, as extremal black holes. And basically in order to get angular momentum conservation, they need to have torsion inside matter. No one can get away from this. Everyone tries to hide it. They try to get rid of the torsion, but it has to be there. It's undeniable, even the supergravity people have it, even the string theorists have it, and it is essentially an anti gravitic field. And this is not a, a perfect analogy, but you can think of the high spin density uh, that sources this anti gravitic field as being somewhat analogous to this high frequency pumping in these metamaterials. It's a completely different effect, obviously, but um, just keep that in mind, just something to bridge the gap. So. Uh, and just to, to remind you what these extremal black holes are, basically, if you have some black hole, it can hawk and radiate, but there are these low, uh, after it radiates all its energy, it reaches some excited state that it can no longer radiate. And those are extremal, and these extremal black holes are essentially fundamental particles. So we have a decent understanding of this. Uh, I figured I would just spotlight another scientist, uh, I meant to grab his picture, Nikodem Poplowski, because he figured out how to use torsional regularization and he applied it to QED. And this really helps um, provide the philosophy for quantum field theory making sense because he showed that it only requires a finite amount of energy to create an electron. And this has been a problem for decades. So since he's in the gravitational community, not many people have seen this work yet and it's very difficult mathematics, so he hasn't extended it to gravity, but 
if this was extended into gravity, uh, it's conjectured that this would help uh, provide UV finite quantum gravity. There's other things that would be needed as well, but there's uh, progress in that direction. So think of this Carton radius as being the size that the minimal size that the particle gets gravitationally from its own spin that basically creates this anti-gravitic field that doesn't want anything to get close to it. You know, just it's a little analogous, but we want to have something somewhat similar to that with these metamaterials. I mean, we want to get this craft that creates this bubble around it so nothing wants to come in. And that way, it's very easy for us to sort of bend around gravitational waves because the waves themselves would just bend around this object. Because to, to us, it would almost look like we're a point particle, so everything would just flow right through. I mean, that might not be literally what is happening, but I think it's the best analogy that we can get for you know some, some engineers today. So another person I want to just uh, put on the spotlight is Hagen Kleiner because he's done a lot of interesting work looking at Einstein Carton theory, which has this torsion, and he models space time as a crystal just as an approximation. And he studies curvature as defects and as well as torsion. And so when you think about this perspective, I mean, it's once again suggesting that space time itself is like a material, right? So to further motivate us to go into metamaterials, trying to point out how um, you know quantum gravity is pointing at this idea that space-time is sort of like a material and also uh, going beyond the torsion there's this notion of conformal gravity this relates to cosmology and to try to get around singularities so you want this idea of a geodesic completeness there are kind of pro mathematical issues with general relativity and going to string theory doesn't solve them you need to use conformal gravity. So the string theorist studied conformal gravity as well and figured this out. And this will help with a lot of issues with cosmology. But they also have discussed anti-gravity in this theory. And this theory makes it easier for types of anti-gravitic effects. And a lot of people thought that this would be problematic due to issues of unitarity and causality, but they fix those problems. Okay, and this theory also is magnificent because uh, you may have heard that the Higgs particle is this God particle, but that's it's definitely not the God particle. If there was such a thing, the, the Higgs is a false God particle because nobody is describing the origin of the Higgs mass itself. But this conformal gravity theory does that. So what it ends up doing is it turns all of these mass parameters. In conformal gravity, everything is massless. It has to be that way. But you get these scalar fields and when you study how this scalar field um, condenses, when you basically symmetry break to low energies, the scalar field takes a constant value and it sets a mass. So it's a gravitational Higgs mechanism. And this is very elegant physics. And so it unifies the Higgs mass, the cosmological constant that's causing the expansion of the universe and Newton's gravitational constant all into this dynamical scalar field. And this is very similar to what Jack Sarfati is doing because he's trying to add this scalar field to Newton's gravitational constant. So uh, I, I say all this unified field theory stuff just to motivate Jack's work because otherwise it might just seem like he's saying something crazy. So in this most general theory of relativity, we'll just go through a brief history. Um, I wanted to mention heavy set gravity just because a lot of these anti-gravity people, they like to talk about it, but they don't understand the mathematics of it and they start saying dumb things. So. Basically, this heavy side gravity used electrodynamics for gravitational theory, but it doesn't match experiment. Um, maybe, maybe there's a chance it'll work, but I don't think so. And people often point to Hefemenko as solving it. He's, he implied he solved it. I bought his book, I read it, he did not solve it. So we can't just claim that heavy side gravity is gonna give us anti-gravity. We need to go to general relativity, but I want to point out that metric affine gravity contains general relativity with other forces that are equivalent to heavy side gravity. So even if heavy side gravity isn't the final gravitational theory, there is some partial truth to this because it might turn out that this heavy side gravity term is a gravitational field. However, it's realistically not feasible in experiment today because we still don't understand how it works. Maybe it's theoretical possible, but it's going to be a very weak effect, very, very weak. So we can't really rely on heavy side gravity to get what we need. Um, just to talk about more legitimate scientists who have discussed uh, 
interesting ideas such as space travel. Uh, recently, there's a paper by Maldacena and collaborators where they're discussing this brain world idea, which is what I'm talking about, and they're embedding in higher dimensions. They're using this. Um, he studies ADS CFT holography, and the CFT is conformal field theory. It ends up being related to this conformal gravity theory that I was talking about. And so he was able to get uh, traversable wormholes, so he claims. And I mean, it, maybe it's a little interesting. I, I kind of looked at it very quickly and did some back of the envelope calculations. Maybe with what he was describing, maybe he could get like a half of a proton through this wormhole. Uh, it, it was going down 10 to the minus 18 meters is what I was. it seemed like. And realistically, we can't even make experimental contact with that. So we're starting to get people who are thinking about these ideas and showing that it is legitimate, but we're still far away. Well, maybe not. Let's see that. OK, so everyone talks about this LQBR drive because we can get the solution to Einstein's field equations that allows for high speed travel. And the problem with it is it requires a lot of negative energy density. OK, it's one thing to get the negative energy density, but how do you get enough of it, right? That's the big problem. No one is talking about it. Anyone who, you know, they, they'll talk about heavy side gravity or general relativity. I mean, you have to talk about general relativity here, but I mean, anyone who's talking about these solutions, they'll just make some vague statements and not do any of the mathematics to show how they're getting a strong enough effect. Okay, so we need to now talk about electrodynamics because we need to talk about materials. So Maxwell's treatise uh, is prolific, obviously. He introduced these electromagnetic fields. Well, he wasn't the one to introduce them, but he really fully understood them and how they all fit together. So he had this electric and magnetic field, and he also had this electromagnetic potential. He had three different variables that were all independent, and he had three types of energy. I read his, um, I read some of his work like his, from him himself, and he talked about these three types of energy. And today, this is called the, the macroscopic formulation. Uh, shortly after, everyone was interpreting his work and simplified it and they have the electric and magnetic field at this time. And then quantum mechanics came along and then they said, no, 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 the electric and magnetic fields aren't fundamental, it's the electromagnetic potential. So now today we believe that the electric and magnetic fields are kind of this afterthought and really this electromagnetic potential is fundamental. But uh, I just want to remind you that Maxwell actually said that all three were fundamental. So that's, maybe he was onto something. And so now when we get into macroscopic materials, I also want to mention that in Maxwell's treatise, he pretended the microscopic was like the macroscopic. And then everyone, after the fact, after they didn't have experimental data on cosmology yet, they assumed, you know, Einstein and them, they, they just wanted this flat, very boring universe that's very static, but we're not finding that. And so since they were hoping for that static universe, they made everything microscopic when in real, reality, we need to think about macroscopic materials. So when you do this, you can get this notion of an index or a fraction because the, the transverse electromagnetic waves, which is light, they can travel at different speeds. If you've ever uh, put a straw in water, you see that the straw gets bent and that is because of the index of refraction of water in comparison to air and the, the light is traveling at a different speed. So it affects how we visualize that. And basically there's different types of exotic uh, electromagnetic effects that can happen. Some of them to note, um, far fields only contain these transverse electromagnetic waves, which contain these two polarization states. And, um, but we also have to consider near fields and plasma physics also looks into these sort of noisy um, out of phase modes that might be longitudinal and they don't get into the radiation zone, uh, but they are there in the near zone. So there's, there are these third mode that exists. And also superconductors uh, provide an effective mass to the photon inside the material, which is a, it, it's turning on this third mode. So I don't know, maybe Maxwell is on to something when he said there's three types of electromagnetic energy. Um, anyway, so now when we look into the macroscopic electrodynamics of materials, we, I'm going to suppress all of the vectors. So really, the electric field is a vector that points in three dimensions, but I'm going to simplify everything for this talk. So there's an electric field E and a magnetic field B. And in vacuum, they have these epsilon naught and mu naught, which are the permittivity and perme permeability of free space. And these constants relate to the speed of light, which is a constant in vacuum. And, but in materials, as I said, this speed can change. And what is happening is that there is actually more than the electric and magnetic field in this macroscopic formulation. 
there's this notion of dielectricity and magnetism, which you can think of the dielectricity as essentially the electric field with adding in this polarization effect. So if you've seen, uh, you know, certain types of uh, metals can get polarized and like iron filings and stuff like that. So you can see that you can have materials that get this polarization that is in addition to the electric field, but it's only inside the material. And so this D dielectricity is important to characterize those effects. And so instead of this epsilon naught, you get this epsilon, which describes the proportionality of the dielectricity to the electric field. And a similar story happens for the magnetic field. You get this notion of H, uh, this type of magnetism, uh, which includes this magnetization M and that goes into B. So in vacuum, we have epsilon equals epsilon naught and mu equals mu naught, which implies that P and M equals zero. And these quantities end up go in, they, they're in the equation for the index of refraction. So the, the speed of light in materials ends up using these epsilon and mu instead of the epsilon naught and mu naught. And you basically take these the ratio here of the speed of light in vacuum to the speed of light in material to get the index of refraction. And I have to say for the metamaterial story, it's much more complicated than this. Really these epsilon and mu's are tensors, uh, four tensors and they're relativistic. It gets a little complicated, but if you're already doing general relativity, it's not that bad. So basically we have these different materials and you can have different regions. So most materials, uh, epsilon and mu, you can look at this ratio. So if you look at the ratio of epsilon over epsilon naught, we can define this dimensionless quantity epsilon r, and we can do the same thing for mu. So most materials they're around one for this epsilon r and mu r, so they're going to be above zero. But there are these different phases that you can have, and when you have both below zero or one or the other below zero, you get more exotic types of materials. So we're going to need to keep this in mind. So we have some very interesting materials to look at. We're trying to get anti gravity, so. We need some minus signs somewhere. So before we get into metamaterials, I thought of this very vague analogy. So imagine you live in the United States, you always drive on the right side of the road, right? You just assume everything always moves on the right side of the road. So you kind of build your framework of thinking based on that. Locally, everyone always moves in that direction. And so you, you can make up these things. It seems obvious. No one can ever drive on the left side of the road. You know, why would anyone do that, right? It's not the way the laws work, right? Well. You know, you, go, you travel across the sea and you realize that in some small locations of the globe, you know, some phase space of all possible materials that exist in the universe, right? You realize that, oh, maybe maybe in the UK or Australia, they actually drive on the left side of the road. And that's kind of what, what, what is happening with these metamaterials. You kind of think of there being some region of space time where everything kind of tends to flow backwards than the way you would traditionally think. And it it's really not... I don't know, you can think of it as negative energy. It's not really negative energy, it's more effective negative energy. So these metamaterials, in general, metamaterials are designed to have specific engineering properties, you know, for whatever application you're interested in. So this negative index of refraction is what we're gonna be interested in. And basically you can think of these different regions. Of, so if you had vacuum and then you have this metamaterial, you can think of there being this energetic domain wall and this picture matches nicely with some of the conformal gravity uh, way of thinking. It's like you get these regions that are kind of separate, embedded in space-time, and they, the energy flows differently. So from the outside, it almost appears like it's a point, but really it's taking up a volume. And so it's not really negative energy because when you're inside, to you, there's no negative energy. It's not like there's anti-gravity for you, right? In your world, in your bubble, there's no anti-gravity. Outside, there's no anti-gravity, but there's effective anti-gravity from the, I guess, the frustration of the boundary from the transition, uh, you know, the boundary conditions going from the vacuum to the metamaterial. So that's why it's not as paradoxical as a lot of people might think. And you can kind of think about invisibility cloaking because this stuff, you know, metamaterials have been used for cloaking and that bends light around. And, you know, that's, that's halfway there, maybe not even halfway there, but that's kind of the, the sort of idea, you know, if, if you're cloaked, all the light just bends around. And what we want to do is that on a, rather than for light alone, we want to do that for everything that has energy for the entire gravitational sector, such that everything tends to want to bend around it. It would be ener energetically favored to do that. So rather than 
you know, we don't want a, a rocket that's going to fight against wind resistance. We want to create something that prefers energetically for it to not participate in the gravitational fields. And so you can imagine inflating and shearing space time in exotic ways such that energy would tend to want to flow around it. That's the way I think about it, at least. So uh, my next spotlight is Jack Sarfati. And David Kaiser, who's a, a, a physics historian, has called him one of the, the hippies who save physics. So he's thought about some of these crazy ideas, such as time travel. And, but he actually has some serious mathematics to back up a lot of what he says. So that's why I've uh, focused on him. And he's been the one to really point out that the alchemy Vieira drive alone is not efficient. It requires too much of this negative energy. We need to do something to get over this problem. And we need to recognize that uh, you know these metamaterials and looking at macroscopic electrodynamics allows for this variable speed of light. And he might not exactly describe it the way I'm about to describe it, but this is how I kind of made sense of it and internalized it for myself. Um, basically, the speed of gravitational waves is the same as the speed of light. Everything, everything that is massless moves at the speed of light. So when we say the speed of light, it's technically a misnomer. It's really the speed of massless particles, which includes light and includes gravitons, which is gravitational waves, right? So if we affect the speed of light, we have to keep in mind that for macroscopic general relativity, that is going to affect gravitational waves as well, right? So think historically what happened when I said Maxwell wanted to have his macroscopic theory for everything and everyone decided to do this microscopic formulation that was formalized and then general relativity was established based off inspiration off the microscopic formulation but now we need to go to study macroscopic materials so we need to revisit macroscopic electrodynamics and understand how to generalize general relativity into the macroscopic materials framework because we understand that gravitational waves are just massless particles, just like photons. So um, basically, Jack's idea is that pumped metamaterials, uh, there's this idea of Froelich, pump, Froelich pumping, hope I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, could lead to these types of exotic effects. So I'm going to show just a brief progression of Jack's ideas. So we're going to start with Einstein's field equations. Once again, we have the curvature on the left-hand side of the equation. Think of this as being some coupling constant in between. We have the, the gravitational, Newton's gravitational constant up here and the speed of light. And we have the energy momentum tensor. This is where all the matter is coming in and sourcing the, the curvature. And then the curvature then tells matter how to move as a fictitious force. And so now when we go into simple materials, you could imagine this C to the fourth getting some correction factor from the fact that it's really like a V to the fourth now because we're not... Uh, all the gravitational waves inside the material do not move at the speed of light anymore if we had some material. And it doesn't even need to be too exotic, even just water, right? So I, it'd be interesting, what if we put LIGO in water? You know, if we made an underwater LIGO, could we, we could actually, uh, the, the way they calculate those signals, they have to triangulate everything. And they have to use the speed of light to calculate that. So we could actually build a LIGO in water and detect if this if this happens or not so it's you know it's not not some crazy idea it's something that is connected to reality and basically we can take this a step further by i mean this is really jack's area of expertise but i've followed it enough where basically once we start getting these metamaterials that's going to introduce more complications than just the scalar s that's where we're going to have to really consider these tensor quantities that i was talking about uh for the the, the permittivity and uh, stuff like that so what you can end up doing, obviously this is a little bit of a simplification because I'm not telling you what this phi variable is, but you can think about going into complex analysis. It's very common to think about Fourier analysis and um, embed things into a complex plane where I is an imaginary number that is the square root of minus one. And then we relate all the physics to the real quantity. So we put this quantity in the complex plane, we have some E naught, and then we have some complex phase where the real part is giving us some magnitude times some cosine, right? And so if you've done a little bit of electrical engineering, maybe you've seen stuff like this before, and this same type of thing is what Jack is doing here. So we get these absolute values going in here, because really what we have to do is, is recognize that this TAB is in, is, it contains the source from the electromagnetic energy as well. So really this S and this C to the fourth and the V and the T, they're all 
integrated together, all related. So when you go into the details of it, you plug in what the actual energy momentum tensor is for electromagnetism is, you can eventually uh, you know, solve for these variables and put it in this simple form. And this way we can get this cosine that's gonna oscillate and that's gonna give us the ability to have negative energy density. And then the idea is that you wanna pump with the appropriate frequencies such that you can get um, basically this the speed of light, it's too large, so you wanna make it slower, actually. It's, it's ironic, you'd think that if you want to move really fast efficiently, you, you, know, you wanna break over the speed of light. So, oh, maybe you wanna make the speed of light bigger, but that actually makes the problem worse. You wanna make the speed of light smaller. So then it makes the, 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 your, your coupling to curvature um, becomes more manageable. So obviously there's still a lot of great progress that needs to be done with the theoretical analysis here, but this is at least a concrete, simple theoretical understanding of how to get uh, realistic anti-gravity based on general relativity and simply thinking about material science. And so once again, I'll just go through how I think about this analogy. Basically, we can think about how light is bent in water and in special relativity, all massless particles move at the speed of light. So gravitational waves move at this speed as well. It's really the speed of massless particles. Therefore, gravitational waves should travel slower or faster in materials, depending on the material properties. So really this C to the fourth, sorry, when we go to the macroscopic formulation, we wanna think about V to the fourth. And then if V decreases, we can get more curvature for the same matter. And then if we can get some minus sign coming out somewhere, through the, the effects of the metamaterials, then we can get the anti-gravitic effects. Really, we're gonna need the pumping, so it's gonna oscillate between positive and negative. And that's gonna be how maybe we could get to increase efficiencies. But obviously, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done because it's a very difficult barrier to get over. So, um, you know, I'm not gonna go into details. This is almost the end of my talk. And basically, the metamaterials that we might be interested in are stuff that has very small scale structure, things that are nano engineered. And one idea is something like quantum, design, quantum dots, which you, so you could design it to have some, maybe like self similar structure at different scales. There seems to be exotic effects happening there. And I wanna point out that conformal gravity has this scale invariance associated with it. So that's why I was trying to relate the, the, the conformal gravity to the metamaterials because some of these materials have this scale invariance. So if you were to study the mathematics of unified field theory, you're immediately getting into potentially applications for anti-gravity there. So basically some tools that might be useful rather than for analysis, um, there's this notion of scale dependent wavelength analysis, and this is complicated mathematics. So uh, you know if we had some engineers that are computationally um, adept, maybe that's something they could try to learn or something like this. So I think that's pretty much the end of my talk. So if I went through uh, a little fast, I can definitely take some questions and things of that nature. So I guess I'll pause at this point and ask if, uh, I'll, first of all, thank everyone for attending. And second of all, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, well, David, it's Tim. So before we do anything, let me put it on gallery view. And again, I'm not gonna unmute everybody, but I wanna thank you. That was an absolutely tremendous presentation. And so thank you very, very, very much. That was amazing. That was absolutely amazing. Um, and I, I'm, I'm glad that we recorded it. You did go through fast, but you covered an amazing amount of ground with it. So um, I promised Mr. Sarfati that I would put him on first. So let me ask him to unmute now. Hey, Jack, you're still muted, by the way. There we go. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. I must congratulate. Uh, <laughs> I must congratulate you. Uh, um, and that was a really good talk. And I actually um, had some good ideas in there. And actually, I learned a few things from you here. The I, That's right, the, uh, about the connection between the uh, the uh, metamaterials with scale invariance and conformal gravity. Yeah, that was good. Right. So your right. idea of getting this scalar field, I was kind of getting an email debates with Jack and I was like, hey, you're, you're kind of claiming that this scalar field is going to give you some renormalizability. Uh, no, I, I call crap. You know, that's not going to work. And so I started thinking about it more and I realized I was like, well, these conformal gravity people, 
I was like, that's what we need to do. And then I thought about it more and I realized, well, they have this scalar field and it's very similar to what Jack's doing. So Yeah, yeah. so I see that now. That's very good. Uh, <laughs> let me just make a, a couple of comments on the earlier parts of your talk. As it turns out, I first suggested elementary particles as extremal black holes back in the late 1960s, early 70s, when I was working with David Bohm at Birkbeck College, University of London. I actually published a little paper in uh, Nature Physics at the time, Nature Physical Science, a little letter on that. So, and and uh, what I want to point out is the only way, and that, that's good about the Cartan radius. I, I, I have to learn, I don't know that math as much as, well, as you do. We'll have to discuss that. But um, uh, the point is that all this requires the Bohm interpretation of quantum theory, not the Copenhagen, because with the Bohm, you actually have particles, you know, whether they're strings or they're extended, the torsion, all that stuff. And uh, then you had uh, something with uh, about the 14 dimensional thing. I have to see that in more de detail. You send me your PowerPoint, okay? I want to see the whole thing. For sure. Uh, but then you talk about the two rotational angles. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, with this 14. Oh, th and this isn't my idea. I mean, this is coming from Wilczek and Z. Okay, well, it they, turns out yeah. that, that's, uh, what's his name? The Russian guy has the two angles. Um, uh, Shipov, Gennady Shipov's torsion theory. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, he has, so it's, yeah, he, okay. So. A lot of people have studied uh, similar things. That's that's the cool thing. There's a lot of different ways to interpret the mathematics, so a lot of people miss some of the effects, but then study the right mathematics. Yeah, okay, so okay. It's very interesting to yeah. look at it all. Uh, okay, an another point, another point where you're talking about the, uh, the gravitons inside the metamaterials, you know, same speed of light, same as the speed of the light and all that. The important, one important thing, which I think, you know, is happening, the Freud, what the Freud effect does, it's a kind of Higgs mechanism and actually just, it's like a, it's like a gravitational superconductor. Just like, right. a, as you mentioned, the photon gets mass in the superconductor, but because right. of the Freud pumping, it turns out that the graviton also gets a mass inside the metamaterial. Right. And, and, and this, then, but you see, wait, let me just say, what that explains, that explains why the Tic Tac does not have a big atmospheric disturbance outside it. See, because all the exotic gravity effects are localized inside the, the fuselage of the of the Tic Tac because of the finite effective mass of the graviton from the Froelich pumping effect. So it all makes sense. It all, it all fits together. You know? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I think that's the important thing to stress. You know, we're not going into some exotic theories. We're sticking to the, the mainstream conventional um, you know, special stuff, and uh, and of course uh, now I, I do see. Uh, I was kind of resisting your, you know, going into the exotic conformal field theory, but I think that uh, I think that's a good idea now. Uh, now I see. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Well, and, awesome. and if Thank I could you. jump in, um, so now Jack, now that you finally made it to our conference, of course, I would love you to present, and I, I think that you've said that you may be open to that in like late February, perhaps March. Yeah, we'll keep ones or you know, but yeah, yeah, that would and, be wonderful. And, and, and we should probably have Chester, Chester on that also, because uh, yeah, because he, he has a good knack of explaining these complicated things in a pretty clear, simple way. I was very impressed. Very Wonderful. Well, and, and again, David, thank you. And Jack, thank you for joining us and, and contributing. So l let me go to Jeremy Reese now. He's ha He has his hand up. Uh, Jeremy? Oh, first, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining joining us. Um, you covered a ton of ground and uh, people were people, were, people were saying, I don't, you were talking so fast, they couldn't, even, some people were having to keep up. So that was just great. You have to speak fast when you're unloading that much information. Um, that was just, uh, it was like some people were commenting that I feel like I just had six months of schooling. <laughs> well, good. Yeah. And it is recorded. So hopefully people can listen again. Yeah. And then go back. And, and uh, first off, uh, I want to know if you, you can make a, a copy of that, your uh, slides available in PDF for, for our audience. And I could link to that. Um, that would be great. Um, yeah, but, I can do that. Going way back, um, I suppose, to, to Einstein and uh, some of his colleagues like Wheeler. And uh, Wheeler, of course, worked with uh, Dewitt, Bryce Dewitt, um, uh, two names he didn't, uh, that uh, 
I was hoping you could comment on um, some of their work and some of their research. I, I noticed a paper that I found in, in some of my research, um, 1966, on rotating superconductors and gravitational drag by uh, Dewitt. And so it looks like they were, um, in fact, researching this stuff as early as, as the mid-1960s. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I can make contact with that. I mean, Wheeler, there's this Wheeler-DeWitt equation that's studying quantum gravity, and obviously Wheeler was interested in this geometrodynamics and really introduced this wormhole concept. So yeah, when I briefly sketched the ideas from Mal Desena, that was building off that work. And to me, geometrodynamics is the same thing as unified field theory or like gauge gravity, unified quantum gravity. I mean, there's so many different ways you can say it. it's like you can call it twister theory, you could call it string theory, you can call it super gravity. I mean, broken, maybe the supersymmetry is broken. We don't have to get into that, you know. Um, there's all these different names. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, Wheeler had this idea that everything is sort of made of the same stuff, right? And that that is the idea of Einstein to unify everything. So I, I definitely believe. Bit. Yeah, and then getting into the quantum mechanical interpretation, focusing on the information. So then we can get into arguments you know, what's more fundamental, so the information perspective versus the, the physical stuff itself. Um, but, you know, yeah, I, it's definitely related here, for sure. Um, another thing I, I wanted to uh, point out, um, S S you know, uh, Sabine Hosefield, she's got a real popular uh, channel. She's a quantum gravity theorist on YouTube. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She, uh, she did a recent video talking about warp drive, and um, she mentioned a paper by um, Alexei Bobne Bobrick. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of them or heard of any of these people. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I've heard of, uh, was it Hassan Felder? Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I know she looks into superfluidic dark gravity, which actually might be vaguely relevant for some of this stuff. So that might be why she is interested in those types of things. But I haven't looked into those details. So yeah, I mean, I'd be interested to look into them more. Uh, yeah, I have to admit, obviously, I, I don't mainly look into anti-gravity effects, but I've just kind of been following the story enough where, um, you know, I saw what Jack was doing and figured I could explain it. So, yeah, I'm interested to look at a little deeper. There's definitely more stuff out there that I haven't seen. Right. Um, and then uh, I have another thing. Um, my final question was uh, about entanglement theories of gravity and uh, and kind of how some of these guys really, I, I noticed you mentioned um, Polyakov. Um, there's another physicist who posted on some of these uh, forums uh, named uh, David Waite, who's uh, contacted me, and he's got a channel as well. I don't know if you've uh, uh, ever heard of him, but he's got some interesting um, tensor transformations and which, uh, has done some work in, in C-tensor um, on, on some of this that I thought was interesting and relevant. I was wondering if you had heard of him either. I feel like I might have heard the name, but I don't, I, I don't remember right now what he's worked on, so I can't really comment. Um, I just thought of another thing in terms of the my perspective on the Wheeler DeWitt equation. Um, they had this idea that there is no time, and right. that is sort of this quantum mechanical thing. So, in, in terms of my investigation, quantum it's called quantum non locality, too, right? Yeah. So, I mean, there's various, I mean, some people like some strength theorists to uh, compactify everything to a point, and then so it's like there's no space. Um, you know, they're trying to get this information theoretic thing, and you get this idea that there's the quantum wave function and then there's this universal wave function. And really, if you zoom out to everything, uh, it's just this pure state that isn't evolving. It's very similar in thermodynamics. When you have a steady state solution, it doesn't evolve over time. It just stays in the same state. So then it's kind of like there's no time evolution. There's no time because it just stays the same. And so that idea has gotten into the, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. I mean, it's it's because they get this Hamiltonian where it's just equal zero. And so it's kind of a joke. Oh, well, not a joke. I mean, people take it seriously, but it's like this theory where it's like, okay, the answer, it's like, what's what's the theory? It's like H is zero. It's like, what? Okay. You know, so that, that's why people like talking about it too, because it sounds a little curious, but I think with the multiple time dimensions, it changes this story a little bit. And there there's some, I haven't published it yet, but there's some math I'm working on where basically the, the Wheeler, when you go into extra dimensions, it gives you extra terms. And so the time dimensions gives me the, the, like I get three mass eigenstates for the different masses. So those end up coming into my, my uh, Hamiltonian. So when you basically study multiple time dimensions and embed one time in multiple times and then reconcile causality, the Wheeler -Witt equation can be modified so it actually isn't zero anymore. So, I mean, this is obviously not published yet and something I'm just starting to look into, but a eh, small comment. 
Awesome, awesome job. Thank you again. And everyone now watching, smash that like button and share this. This was this was the best one yet, I swear. This is yeah, great. Yes, this, so is, this is wonderful. And Jeremy, thank you for the question. So let me go to Mark Fiorentino next. Uh, Mark, th there you are, sir. Yes, hello. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, if uh, Einstein was alive today, uh, would he agree with this statement, gravity is equal to a contraction of space? I mean, I guess he would just have, I mean, he had the curvature. I, I think Einstein would really be interested in the fact that there, in metric affine gravity, there are three different equivalent theories of general relativity that have completely different perspectives and they give you the same math. So what we're finding in quantum field theory is there's all these different theories the concepts look completely different, but in rare cases, you can get them to predict the same thing. So that really makes you start to think about how much does our conceptualization actually even matter? You know, these people will cling on, it's like, I have the right concept, I'm thinking about it the right way, but it could turn out there's multiple ways to think about it that get to the same result. So, and I think this is really at the notion, of generalizing the notion of coordinate independence and unifying it with gauge theory Einstein really almost invented gauge theory with teleparallelism because it turned out to be a gauge theory. So um, I think he would be, realize that he would look at the other forces of nature and be amazed by how many different ways there are to describe it and hopefully uh, be open-minded enough to consider multiple explanations. <laughs> That's kind of my cop-out answer. <laughs> well, I, I, are you familiar with his happiest thought concerning general relativity? Let's see, what was his happiest again? Einstein followed the line of reasoning that began with his happiest thought of his life. Still at the Swiss patent office, he conducted one of his famous thought experiments. Einstein imagined a circle spinning in space. The center of the circle did not move, but its circumference was moving quickly in a circular direction. Einstein compared what happens in several reference frames, which is a standard tool he had used in developing the special relativity theory. He concluded using his special relativity that the boundary of the disk contracted as it spun. There was oh, okay. a force acting on the circle at the boundary, the centrifugal force. Mm -hmm. And its action was analogous to that of the gravitational force, but the same contraction that affected the outer circle left the diameter unchanged. Thus Einstein concluded in a way that surprised even him, the ratio of the circle uh, to the diameter was no longer pi. He deduced that in the presence of a gravitational force field, the geometry of space was non-Euclidean. So he got the idea of how to bend space mechanically, <laughs> physically. So that's what was inspiring him to Definitely. confirm that in his mind, it was a contraction of space and he had a definite mechanical me a mechanism to do that. So that's why I think it okay, was Okay, Rock, you said it enough already. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need a bunch of elementary, uh, you know, the, let's, uh, this is off topic. It's okay, but you know. Well, I don't, you, think, I don't think it's off me? topic. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's an interesting point. Um, there is actually a lot of interesting controversial ideas where you even think about material, you know, these types of materials and you rotate them very fast uh, to actually go through calculating all that is, is kind of interesting to look at. And I think that is intimately related to, you're, you're actually hitting on the point, some of the things related to the torsion aspects, because right. if you have oh, a really high I'm, spin density. I'm glad you brought that up. Excellent. So, I mean, at the end of the day, you have to look at the most general mathematics for differential geometry and Carton helped bring some of that and that might be relevant for reconciling angular momentum conservation, especially if we have quantum spin. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, I think, yeah, that sounded great. So yeah, that, <laughs> that, that is basically the angle I'm working and I use the moment of inertia equation to uh, work out the problem of gravity. Yeah, well, I think I think I, th I think uh, I think that's wrong. <laughs> well, let's. I think let's, a lot of physicists would say that. Yes, but 
it's I don't believe also it. also by the way Einstein's happiest thought Einstein's happiest thought in the literature has to do with the equivalence principle now not with what you were talking about although what you're talking about is also important but yeah. it's not generally called uh Einstein's happiest thought it was well, I just quoted it from Amir Excel's book uh from, who, from which from who you quoted Amir, from where Amir D Excel say it He's again a physicist he wrote the book God's Equation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, they, 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 he got it wrong. He got, he got it. It's it's not quite accurate. The 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 happiest thought was when the um, guy fell off the ladder in the uh, tower. Uh, he was painting the tower in Z in Zurich, and the guy said the painter said he felt weightless when he was falling, and that's what inspired Einstein with the equivalence principle which was one of the several important ideas leading to the general theory of relativity. Well, that- and So to, to connect those ideas, I just wanna say that studying the equivalence principle in the most general differential geometry is very interesting. And yeah. that's what yeah, gets right. into right. these equivalent theories. And yeah. Well, okay. doesn't the equivalence principle connect acceleration <coughs> to gravity? Sure, yes. Sure. Yes. Well, let me, so let me, uh, sorry about that. I, I've got got a bunch of different messages kind of conflicting with each other here. Um, Let's keep it coming. Yeah, well, uh, so so one person, and I'm not sure where I went. Oh, Rob Chambers had asked um, about einstein carton evans theory. Um, Ron, do you want to unmute yourself, Rob? There we go. Evans, Evans, is it? Uh, Rob uh, Chambers, hello? sorry. Yeah, Rob, you there? Hello? Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, no, it, it's just something that uh, that I remember from uh, uh, someone who's who's tried to apply Cartan theory. Uh, although I think it's still quite a classical theory, and it's uh, it's not well. I don't think it's very well known or well supported necessarily. I don't know if it. Uh, right. So the Einstein Cartan Evans theory. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I actually have looked into this a fair amount. So this is, I would say, inconclusive because it gets to a point where it's clear that there is a lot of work written and I, I can, let's just take a bet there, there is a typo somewhere in this work because even the best textbooks have sometimes hundreds of typos. It gets to a point when you read their work, it's honestly very difficult to tell what they're talking about because there's so many subtleties and they, they have to really carefully define their notation. That is one of the biggest problems I find with their work because there are so many bold claims and they're discussing maybe interesting mathematics, but they, they definitely get some things wrong, like very basic uh, like ideas about what gauge symmetries are. They're, they're thinking of interesting ideas. I mean, I looked into that stuff and it honestly motivated me to revisit Maxwell's treatise. If I didn't hear about Tom Bearden, for instance, I probably would not have read Maxwell's treatise. So mm -hmm. I want to say that to say I'm open minded and maybe it's slightly inspirational, but obviously it's a very controversial theory and it has too many bold claims. It's not very productive for yeah. most scientists because it's um, it's taking too many leaps and there might be some good ideas in there, maybe, but it's it's hard to tell what how to how to really get to simplify what's going on there. And it's there seems to be a little shady. I don't know, the, the way they co-authored papers was a little bizarre at times. It's hard to know. Uh, it, I don't know, there could be some dishonesty there, but then Tom Bearden got this patent in the US and it's very difficult to get the patent that he got. You need someone to confirm an experiment, but it, it's very mysterious to me. So I, I don't really know what to make of it, to be honest. Yeah, same here. <laughs> and I don't think Thanks. it's productive to try to, honestly, it's more productive to do it right. and. You know, if you want to read that stuff, great, and try to figure out how to do it right, I would yeah, say. But the, the Evans is a waste of time. What's his name? Yeah. Uh, but to Hoof, to Ger Jared to Hoof really knocked it down, at least his yeah. electrodynamics. I didn't realize he had a gravity theory, too. But, uh, yeah, that whole alpha, were you talking about the alpha, the alpha group in, in Budapest? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, they're, they're, just forget that. They're, they're very... <laughs> There's something very strange about that whole yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. They also, uh, Vigier, you know, Jean-Pierre Vigier was part of our group 
uh, with Joe Firmish at the uh, ISSO back uh, 20 years ago. And uh, they used, they, they used for, uh, Vigier's name in a paper, which Vigier didn't even know they, they did it. So th- it w- there was a lot of dishonesty there. <laughs> it's a waste of time, unnecessary. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay. And so let me go to Eric Hermanson next. Sir? Hi. Yeah, so, so I like to think about this physically. So we have this uh, EM field being pumped into the metamaterial. Uh, and, and so there's photons being pumped in with a certain frequency. And then they have a spin of, of H-bar. And, and one of the reasons why neutrinos don't interact with matter very well is because their spin is H-bar over 2. And so, uh, you know, That's the atomic... Cool. And, That's it, not it, it's regardless, you know, regardless so, of all so, that. Yeah. So, so spin, spin momentum. Yeah, go for it. Has to Electrons that spin one half, they interact fine with matter. So no, what you spin is I, false. No. Well, guys, hold, hold on. Let me, they, let me, let me let Eric not, finish his question. Yeah, let, let finish. Let finish. Yeah. So, so they won't interact. So atomic and molecular orbitals uh, have, uh, they, they, they have a spin of H bar. That's why photons are able to conserve their spin when when they excite these these uh these orbitals into a higher energy state and so what's happening is there's this this these photons so so the metamaterial has a a, a permittivity a permeability and, a, and, a, and an index of, ref, of refraction and that's all fine uh, but the photons still come in and they still have to interact electromagnetically with uh, the the orbitals of the material and right. so i i would like uh, you to maybe explain very briefly um, how this affects, and I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm just, uh, right. can you can you can you connect the the, the physical um, interactions to how this will cause, um, uh, you know, the, the the warp effect, if you will. Or, yes, or the answer is yes, and I've done that in the mathematics. And if you understood the mathematics, which you clearly don't, you wouldn't be asking. Okay, Jeff, Jeff, shut, no, shut your. I, I asked, I asked Charles. Uh, okay, okay. Question, okay? Yeah, uh, you're, you're so, such an asshole. Yeah, of course. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Eric, Eric, but, you don't know enough physics. You're not even asking. So, hey, you don't know what, you do not know how much physics I know. So yeah, shut up. I know, up, I know, but you know, oh, let's, uh, uh, let's get it together here. I know, guys, I know. Let's, yeah, here, let's, yeah, yeah, sorry. All right, okay. so let me, let me just pause and say, regardless of anything about the spin and H bar over two, okay, uh, study some material science uh, or condensed matter theory and realize that the materials have fractional statistics as well. Uh, so when you have, when you're pumping these photons in, the, the physics completely changes. You really need to study a lot of complicated mathematics and it's not just like this spin one half story anymore. It's way different. Uh, you, you know, there, there are things called anions, for example, that they've experimentally <laughs> detected that are occurring as fractional statistics. So there's like all this mathematics for new phenomena that um, yeah, it, it, there's a lot of exotic effects. So there's just a lot of different things out there that, um, I don't know, based on like the opening statement you made, I'm just saying that look into like anions, for example, just to understand that type of thinking and look into some condensed matter theory and maybe that'll like help open your mind for at least seeing different types of effects. Uh, and then um, maybe start to think about the, the negative refractive index stuff. And just follow it through. I mean, I, you know, I'll trust you if you, you know, if you oh, know all asking, physics, I'm look into it. How, I'm asking how the, how momentum is conserved, and I'm asking how how that um, it, it, is that conservation of momentum involved in in this interaction. Of yes. course, all the no, symmetries no, are obeyed. No, no. <laughs> Jack, 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 Jack. <laughs> okay, so I mean, yeah, it, it's pretty standard stuff it's just uh everything's conserved nicely it's 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 very benign anti-gravity actually right like like i was saying when you're in the region it's not a repulsive force you know first of all gravity isn't even a real force it's a fictitious force so when you're in the vessel you know you're not gonna feel any anti-gravitic effects when you're outside the vessel you're not gonna feel any anti-gravitic effects though the best way i can describe it is effectively when you're outside it almost appears as if this finite volume is more like a point so everything just kind of all the energy just bypasses it um that, that's I, I would say a toy model explanation that might not even be exactly correct but you know for a talk i think that's a decent enough picture uh, now, let me see. I had another question here. 
Uh, and I'm not sure who was asking it, but he was asking if you had seen the Hutchison effect videos. Hutchison yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you had any thoughts on those. And I believe he was probably talking about the, the gravity part of it. Yeah, I mean, once again, I, 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 well, I think there's a lot of interesting tinkering going on there. I mean, I, I, I am willing to believe that some exotic effects are occurring in his laboratory. Uh, but, you know, once again, I just haven't really looked into the details enough to really understand, okay, what precise effects, are, you know, because a lot of that stuff is just like you see levitation of some very light object. So it, it's very difficult to identify what is actually happening there. You know, is this just some electromagnetic effect or is it actually a gravitational effect? I suspect a, a lot of his stuff is just, um, you know, exotic electromagnetism and, and doesn't really make contact with gravity, but okay. I don't know. So, yeah. Uh, okay. It's uncontrolled. We can't do anything with Hutchison. It's, you know, it's too uncontrolled. Yeah, yeah. We don't need it. We don't need it anymore. We, we, we have a pretty precise path now to understanding the Tic Tac. By the way, Frank Milburn is here, I think. I don't see, I see. He's, he, 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 he is. Um, and he's so, on video. Then I am here, guys. Now, would you guys, would you guys like to go, because we're kind of invading David's Q&A time, and so I don't want to drive everybody nuts, but then I, I also appreciate your being here and as well as Frank. Um, Fine with me. Whatever. Uh, what, yeah, yeah I think here, here's the thing that I mean, uh, Tim Ventura and Frank did a video last night, I think it was, on the military threat, because we are interested now in the Tic Tac, right? We're interested in, in the US Navy close encounters with these objects and how to understand them. Okay. So, um, uh, and here Frank is here. He's the military, you know. I mean, Frank, were you, were, were you British Army or British Air Force? I was in the British Army. Is the sound okay, guys? Yeah, yeah, you said enough. Yeah, I was I was in the British Army, but uh, I served basically across tri service, so uh, with uh, you know Navy, Royal Air Force, Army. Oh, okay. oh yes, and um, the thing is, this we we think we should take advantage of Frank being here because really a military problem, isn't it? And we we're we'll talking about the military threat of this advanced technology. Well, and, and so I guess what I'm wondering is maybe we should schedule that. What we had coming up next, now, I mean, we are ahead of time. And so I guess I should square this with the conference to see everybody feels about it. But um, yeah, I, I would be open to it. I mean, what we're, you know, D David ran fast and then I think we went through the Q&A pretty fast as well. So. Um, I mean, yeah, just to make a comment on that, I would say that let's not get into fear mongering, honestly. I. I I, me personally, I'm more interested in, you know, using this technology to solve problems for humanity. I think one of the biggest problems is transportation, right? Like, think about it. We're, we're like, we have hunger issues.